welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our regular city council meeting. Uh, it's Tuesday, August 22nd, 2017, and this is the beginning of our um, city council meeting located here at the Veterans Memorial Hall. Um, for the record, we do have a quorum and we'll call the meeting to order. Um, our next order of business as we, uh, there's been oftentimes over the last couple of years, we've gone into a moment of silence where we've had the opportunity to reflect and as all of us may know that there's been um, various things that happen within uh, you know, our uh, local area, um, maybe families, loved ones, um, employees, um, give us the time to reflect, um, whether it's Charlottesville, San Bernardino, uh, Texas, um, there's a lot going on. And so as we go into a moment of silence, I just uh, ask that we take a moment to uh, reflect a little bit. So if you please join me in a moment of silence, thanks. Knuckles, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? on the agenda. We don't have any recognitions uh, tonight. Uh, closed session report. Mr. Pony. Thank you, Mayor. We had five items to be discussed, and they were discussed, but there was no reportable action. Thank you. Um, next, uh, count and Mayor and Council Members uh, reports and announcements, and I'll start to my right. Marlis? All right. Well, I uh, told you that I would bring back more information about the event that's going to be held on September 16th. This is the kickoff of the fundraising drive for Cerrito Peak. And for those of you who may not remember, the Council did uh, spend some um, emergency reserve funds to purchase that with the intention of having a nonprofit organization take over the fundraising effort. Uh, the Morro Bay Open Space Alliance has stepped up to the plate, and this is the kickoff event, and the public is welcome. Uh, you can see the, the peak, and you can climb up to the top of it. You can learn about the history of it. There will be some refreshments, and families are welcome. And it is uh, the 16th of September, 2 to 5, that's a Saturday, and it's at Cerrito Place, which is a little street between Olive and Shasta. So we hope to see everybody there. Thanks. Thanks, Marlis. John? Thank you and good evening. Um, just a quick health tip for those of you that love to stay healthy and those of you that don't, maybe you should. Um, it is uh, flu season again and so it's time to get your flu shot. Um, if you're older than 65, you should be getting the high dose flu shot um, available um, locally um, in a number of different venues. Um, if you're younger than 65, then you should get the regular flu shot and there are, um, as you you probably know those strains out there today do not contain mercury, contaminants, most are preservative free, very safe, and so um, keep us and our community um, healthy by getting your flu shot. Thank you. Thanks, John. Matt? Red? Hi. Um, I want to make a report from uh, Recreation and Parks. The community pool is going to fill in October. It's a little behind schedule, but um, uh, October's a pretty firm date. And Kirk is working with school staff to figure out the hours and that it will be available to the public and what the fee schedule is going to be. The pool is 25 yards wide and 35 meters long, and it has 16 lanes. And the water will be kept at 79 degrees. Um, there will not be a therapy pool, though. Um, 
It has covered bleachers, overhead lights, men's and women's locker rooms, showers, storage, and a concessions kiosk. Um, Kirk is forming an informal pool committee to help on programming and uh, to distribute a survey um, to the public uh, from Cambria to Los Osos, asking about um, what kind of swimming activities would you like to see offered and would you like to see in morning, noon, or evening? So that is finally coming to fruition. Um, I'm not going to do office hours this weekend. Um, Gail and I are going to take a road trip starting Friday morning, and our first stop is going to be Crescent City to inspect their wastewater treatment plant. This has been a lifelong dream of Mrs. Davis, <laughs> and I'm going to fulfill it for her. So, so that's all I have. <laughs> Thanks, Red. Uh, uh, I just want to welcome uh, Andrew Hamilton, our uh, new uh, interim finance director. Just want to say hi and, and welcome. And uh, with that, I don't have any announcements, and we'll roll into any reports, uh, city manager reports or anything. Okay, thank you. Um, and tonight we'll start off with a presentation from our visits. Slow Cal, Chuck Davison, welcome. Come on up. We're glad to hear from you. Good evening, uh, Mayor Irons, Council, City Staff. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight. Um, I recall it was just uh, two short years ago when we were in front of you asking for approval to get the district formed, uh, which you graciously granted. So I think we've come a long way in two years. We've got uh, still a long way of opportunity to go, but uh, looking forward to sharing with you just a few minutes um, tonight on some of the efforts over the last year. Um, happy to start out by saying uh, tourism in the county remains strong. Uh, continue to push forward with a number of efforts. I'm going to cover a few of those highlights for you in some slides, and I'm going to show you um, our annual report video, which kind of encapsulates uh, the best you can uh, 10 months worth of work into five minutes. And then um, over the next, uh, in about the next month, you're going to receive um, our formal annual report, which will be approved by our board of directors at our September 20th meeting. So I will uh, jump right in and happy to take questions along the way. As um, I hope every single person in, in this room knows we were instrumental in bringing Amgen back uh, to the Central Coast, but specifically here to Morro Bay back in May. Um, that $50,000 investment and the $32,000 investment into the city of Morro Bay yielded um, two hours of live international television coverage on NBC Sports, which is really invaluable for our destination as we talk about um, encouraging people to travel here in the future. Um, you can see the numbers here on the report. I won't read through them, but we had some uh, very significant impact. These are numbers directly tied to the social media and email promotions, not numbers tied to that two hours of uh, television and what was accomplished. So you can see about half a million social media impressions. A lot of people saw what was happening here in Morro Bay and the efforts that we made. We'll continue to work hard to partner with AEG and are hopeful that um, in the coming years we'll be able to bring that back to Morro Bay yet again. I uh, wanted to give you a quick update on um, Highway 1. Uh, many of you know uh, that the closure is taking place, and uh, that's definitely impacted business up and down uh, Highway 1. We have um, recently, just in the last few weeks, rolled out um, a co-op opportunity with our local destination partners, including all the way down to the hotel restaurant member level. Um, we've set aside $25,000 in funding for this co-op. It's a one-to-one -one match based on local communities or restaurants. Our number can honestly go well north of $100,000. We've got almost half a million dollars in contingency right now uh, that has been set aside. If the board chose to activate that for something like a crisis communication plan around Highway 1, we could do that. It's a great opportunity for um, your, you as a local destination and your local partners to participate in getting your message out there. That co-op is we will, uh, for every dollar they put in, we will put in an additional dollar up to $2,000 per partner, and it's their message that's sold, not ours. So we're championing the message of the local communities and or their business uh, to help drive business down on Highway 1. Uh, with that, I want to give you uh, an update. <clears throat> More specifically related to the Mud Creek uh, closure, uh, over the last two weeks I've met with uh, Senator Monning along with Assemblyman Cunningham uh, last week to talk about um, their ability to help us um, 
might I say gently encourage Caltrans on moving this process forward uh, a little bit quicker. Uh, we I received word yesterday that we should have a finalized date plan from Caltrans before the end of the month on what the timeline is going to be for that reopening. And we received kind of some back channel information that suggests um, we could see uh, a dirt road bypass uh, sometime before the end of the year that at least gets the road open for access. So we're um, anxiously awaiting that information. Morro Bay is faring uh, much better than some of the other communities. We have properties in San Simeon that are off as much as 50% uh, in July. And if they're off in 50% in July, that's not going to uh, vote well for uh, summer and off season. Um, our uh, director of travel trade and our membership uh, sales manager have been out into your community uh, continuously over the last four months, but have visited with all your properties in the last 30 days. Uh, the latest report we have is of the 31 properties, we have 18 properties that are reporting being down or off in business. So we'll continue to monitor that, see ways that we can assist them. One of the keys that we are seeing in those properties that are down is uh, they are the properties that have uh, the least amount of customer service. Um, and so, you know, as we see them build the customer service model and um, have uh, more dependence on themselves and being able to establish long-term relationships, they seem to be succeeding more. So uh, we're also trying to put educational components in place to help them with those customer service mechanisms as well. Um, so strategic imperatives, I want to talk to you a little bit about our conference center feasibility study. You should have all received this study when we released it a few weeks ago, but just a couple quick highlights that our board made uh, this a strategic initiative. Um, we have a gap in, in large facility conference space here in the county. Uh, the numbers definitely proved out in this plan. Um, as you look at the analysis of what cities people would will be willing to go to, you see the range there from San Luis Obispo uh, down to uh, Morro Bay and their willingness to, to pretty much um, attend or participate in a conference that was in any community here in the county. So I think it's a viable option um, at any location. Uh, the, the report came out that we needed somewhere between 15 and 20,000 square feet in ballroom space uh, to seat roughly 1,000 to 1,500 people. As you probably know, the biggest ballroom space currently is the Embassy Suites in San Luis Obispo, which seats about 450. So it's about a, a two, three-fold uh, increase. And I think the most encouraging thing for us is, as you see on this slide, the majority of this business is two Tuesday through Friday, and 70-plus uh, percent of the business is in the off-peak season, meaning non-summer. So uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for whatever community chooses to uh, kind of move this initiative forward. We're uh, there to help sell that space as, uh, if and when the event gets built. Um, quick update on airlines. Uh, I hope everybody's familiar with we now have new direct service um, to Seattle on Alaska Airlines, including the Wines Fly Free program, which was a big win for us for people visiting here to take a case of wine with them home for free without being charged a baggage fee. Um, continue to pace at 85% bookings um, on a daily basis on that flight, um, so much so that we had a headquarters meeting with Alaska on uh, at the beginning of August to already talk about a new destination and possibly an additional flight to Seattle. So we'll keep you posted on that as more of that information develops. Um, everybody should also be aware that we added a fourth daily flight to San Francisco, uh, which is the late evening flight, which is extremely helpful uh, for those trying to get back home to our destination. Along with that, we now have direct service to uh, Denver, um, which if you haven't been on, is really a, a trip saver for people looking to go to the East Coast. And also, uh, in our recent marketing campaign, Denver was the number one pickup market. So uh, we really believe that that uh, consumer who's looking for outdoor adventure, that type of space, is a, a natural fit here for us in our county. Next steps, we continue to work with American Airlines on direct service to Dallas. So that's the that's the next big piece that we're pushing is how much farther east can we get. Um, that would likely require an MRG or a minimum revenue guarantee, which um, our board has already set aside $100,000 to help uh, initial fund. Uh, but we would be looking to local communities, business leaders, tourism partners to help facilitate the balance of that. So more to come on that as, uh, as we move a little farther through the process. Uh, with that said, I'm going to take a minute and show you this uh, year in video and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have.
market, uh, a big win for um, us locally, a big win for our tourism economy, a big win for the locals who live here. Uh, just a really exciting time. again host the Amgen Tour of California. <laughs> While Morro Bay is only 25 miles from Pismo Beach, riders will depart on a 116 mile route. When the racers come into Morro Bay, they're gonna turn left and come down onto the Embarcadero. <laughs> Fast, can wait. Slow, will set you free. Because here in SlowCal, Slow is not falling behind. It's the freedom to catch up with the things that matter most to you. Soon enough, you'll discover the slow cow. It's just your speed. Like when I close my eyes and don't even care if anyone sees me dancing like I can fly and I don't even think We brought with us 12 wineries uh, two distilleries, a brewery, two restaurants. It's a great opportunity for us to create brand awareness for who we are and encourage people to travel to our destination.
overseas tourist market. And here on the Central Coast, businesses large and small are aiming to attract even more Chinese travelers. One of the major uh, attractions for us in San Luis Obispo County is the fact that we're part of the Highway 1 here in California. It's an international destination for a lot of people. They want to come and experience that. But they also love the food and the wine and the ability to get out into the outdoors. Tourism is the number one economic driver in our county when we talk about growth. Why tourism matters, it's a $1.5 billion industry that's employing about 18,000 people a year. And so we get to experience all the wonderful assets that exist because of tourists and we're happy to be here. Okay, well, that concludes our city council meeting for yeah. the night. <laughs> a very quick look at uh, some of the efforts that we've had over the last 10 months. But we would appreciate the opportunity to partner with Morro Bay. As, uh, as Noreen Martin put it two years ago in front of this same uh, council, yeah. there is only one rock. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to promote that for the county. Chuck, thanks for all that. Thanks for the presentation as a partner in the county for promoting our county. It's pretty, um, pretty impressive. So any questions or any comments from council? Red? Yeah, Chuck, we have proven demand for a conference center. So it seems as if the logical next step would be to fill that demand um, and, and to recruit a, a developer. I assume that's that's what we would do. Is, are we taking steps to do that? Yeah, so we've act actively pushed out that feasibility plan to all of the local municipalities. Um, it's really, you know, we, we don't own land or brick and mortar space, and we've made it clear from the beginning, our, our board has, uh, we don't have any intention of building, running, or managing a conference facility, but we do believe that we would be the catalyst to sell that space. Um, and so we have asked for the opportunity to partner with whatever communities are interested in pursuing that effort in not only um, um, helping them create the roadmap to get there, um, but also engaging development resources and, and grant opportunities and things like that to help facilitate it. So there are um, two communities that are, are, are talk, having that conversation kind of a little more actively, um, but we'll, it'll remain to be seen kind of what, what happens with that. Okay, so you, you're looking for it to be community-driven rather than a nationwide hunt for... Yeah, and, a, a and we, you know, we could go out and find a developer, but if, you know, some communities are, are quite frankly, more open to a pro-growth model than others are, and so it doesn't make sense, really, for our, our board determined it didn't make sense for us to lead that effort, but instead to run uh, a parallel path and, and be a supporting partner in helping achieve that. And All thank right. you for being in our annual report video. <laughs> <laughs> and great. And I wasn't ignoring you while you're doing your presentation. I was actually looking up the Pfeiffer, Rig, um, Pfeiffer Bridge on uh, uh, US 1. You can YouTube that, and it can show Caltrans the progress that's being made up. Uh, and they expect a, uh, that portion of Highway 1 to be open soon. And the Alaska Airlines trip was actually pretty good. So thanks for, for your work on that. And um, with that, you know, thanks very much, Chuck. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, next on our uh, uh, agenda, we have a public comment period for items not on the agenda, and we do start it off with our business spot. We're going to welcome Annie Clapp and the Chablis Cruises. If you want to come up and start us off for public comment, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, City Council, Mayor, and staff. Um, my name is Annie, and I'm one of the owners of Chablis Cruises and also the Morro Bay Coffee Company. We are a family-run business. My sister, my mom, and myself uh, run Chablis Cruises. My husband is the chef. Um, we do private charters. We also do a weekly champagne brunch. We do a weekly, uh, so the champagne brunch is on Saturday, and we do a Sunday chowder cruise weekly. We do lots of private charters. We do birthday parties and family um, family parties, corporate events, and the reason we have the coffee shop is so we can do the cooking at the coffee shop, and so my husband runs that. We do fair trade organic coffee, and he bakes everything from scratch, so he's, you know, at, at the coffee shop and 
eight o'clock at night making the doughs for the next morning, which is really exciting. Plus, you know, he's also making the meals for, uh, for the cruises that we do hold on Chablis. Um, Chablis cruises were uh, in our 10th year of business and we're very thankful for, to be in business 10 years. And we think it's kind of neat. There's been a party boat in Morro Bay since the 20s. And so and we think that's neat to continue that on. Um, we are a catalyst uh, for tourism in Morro Bay. We have people that come to Morro Bay and have a party on our boat, but they're going to stay all weekend and purchase you know, several different meals, go shopping, put gas in their car, and then and also stay, you know, at hotels one or two nights, and so we think that um, our business is a really viable part of that tourism that um, we're, we're seeking right now. We hope to be, um, you know, in business many more years to come, and we want to thank you so much for your support. Annie, thank you. Um, so, with public comment being open, uh, first up is Tom Rost, and then Kerrigan Mahan. Uh, Mayor and uh, City Councilman uh, and women, uh, Tom Rost, uh, 640 Sequoia Court, Morgan Bay. Uh, I noticed that in March 12th, uh, 2017, you sent to Cayucas a, a memorandum of understanding to be uh, Cayucas to be the customer of Morro Bay. It appears to me that, in fact, if it was good enough to send to Cayucas for them to be the customer, it is also good enough for Morro Bay to be the customer of Cayucas. So uh, I have uh, redrafted uh, Morro Bay uh, Memorandum of Understanding a draft and uh, just turning around the words. Um, and I will submit that to you and to your city attorney and clerk. Um, what does it do? It stops the financial drain on this town of approximately 10,400. It eliminates your consulting engineers immediately. It places the responsibility on your city utility director uh, and your uh, city engineer to cooperate and uh, design the, a plant that allows, or, or a system, not a plant, a system that allows you to be a customer of Cayucas, and I believe that all of that can be done for less than $30 million. That's uh, certainly different than the $166,900,000 that you have uh, had proposals from your uh, experts. It creates uh, a greater opportunity for water reclamation by going to Cayucas because they have numerous capabilities that you're not going to have. It, it creates the least amount of inter infrastructure disruption in the city. It protects the neighborhoods and it stays within the March 2015 rate structure. It compiles, the, it complies with the guidelines of the Coastal Commission, the Regional Water Board, and I uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Rost. Next, Kerrigan Mann. Good evening, City Council. Mayor Irons, staff. I'm really here tonight to um, thank Tom for sharing this uh, submittal that I read in depth uh, yesterday. Um, I, I feel like every time I come down here, I'm, I'm attacking, and I don't, I don't want to be contentious, but. I have to continue hammering and addressing the astronomical amounts of money that are being spent. I think it's time to clean house. I think it's time to say goodbye to certain consultants who have I, I, I refrained from certain words. 
who have cost this city $10 million, $12 million, $9 million, whatever the silly figure is. I would like to know what would be conceivably involved. Uh, I don't know how, how, how this works, but you all voted four to one on a $711,000 uh, bill for a Water One report. And, and I really feel very strongly that we have uh, engineers here locally, retired engineers that can step in and, and do this job uh, happily for a third of the price. And I don't know why. I'm trying to get to the bottom of why and how we continue to spend this kind of money. Why do we continue hiring these five-star outside consultants? I, 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 I'm trying to find what what motive and and I, I and I find it criminal and, and I say that not literally I hope but I think it's time for some possible investigating as to what's going on again I say to you I, I can't imagine that you allowed or even vaguely considered a 167 million dollar sewer plant it's completely insane and we all know it's going to have horror. Well, I think, we, I think we're past that. I don't think that's anything we have to further discuss, I would hope. Uh, I think the Cayucas is, is a tremendous route, and I hope you read very carefully, and I hope we can get past personalities and do something that makes sense. I felt very uncomfortable two weeks ago <clears throat> exposing the amount of money that we're spending on our city attorney. Um, again, I know most uh, cities, the smallest towns, do, do, do this way of billing as opposed to being on salary. Uh, but this billing has doubled itself every year in the last four years. And we're going to be at a million dollars in 2017. I'd like to know what we're, what we're getting for a million dollars from the city attorney. Anyway, thank you. I'm out of time. Thanks, Kerrigan. John Silver, I might not have pronounced that right, I'm sorry. Siler, okay, thank you. And then uh, Tina Metzger. Good evening. I'm, my name is John Siler, I'm an unemployed high school teacher here in Morro Bay. I uh, just want to say we judge ourselves by our intentions. We tend to judge other people by their actions or the results. Now since our intentions are usually good, we usually feel that, well, we're in the right. Just good intentions alone aren't enough. Recently, like I mentioned, I, well, I have been a high school teacher. We had something called No Child Left Behind. It had bipartisan support. Both Senator Kennedy and President Bush were for it. Their intentions were very good, but it was a complete disaster. So all I'm kind of saying is that uh, don't question people's intentions. I think they're good, but we do want good results. And I'm out of time. Thank you. Tina Metzger. And then uh, Hostetler. Sorry if I didn't pronounce that right. Callie Hostetler. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Tina Metzger, Morro Bay. Uh, with all the efforts and money, hopes, dreams, of local businesses and our tourist industry, I have to continue to question the wisdom of the council pushing for a 250-acre site for a sewage treatment plant on the gateway to Morro Bay. Why do you continue to push this? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly Hostetter. Good evening, City Council. I am Kylie, and I'm a Girl Scout from San Luis Obispo. Um, I'm here to talk about reclassifying e-cigarettes as cigarettes in this, um, in this area. 
uh, a couple months ago, my troop and I went to the sandwich. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Can you pull down the microphone? It's. I really. Yeah. We. So we can hear you. Thank you. Please, please take A couple time. months ago, I went to the San Luis Obispo Tobacco Control Board with my troop, and we learned a lot about e-cigarettes um, and why they are harmful. Um, firstly, according to the California Healthy Kids Survey, which asked kids if they had smoked in the past 30 days, 11% of 7th graders smoke in all. 3% of them smoke conventional cigarettes, while 8% of them smoke electronic. I don't think that's good, even if you don't think that electronic cigarettes are harmful. And also, in ninth grade, 20% of them smoke. That's a fifth, double the seventh graders in just two years. It gets worse in 11th grade because 25% of 11th graders smoke. I don't think that's acceptable. That's more than a fourth. Uh, according to Tara Leonard, the fun colors and flavors in e-cigarettes make it so that many kids want to have them. And it works because 16% of 7th graders vape and 9%, almost a tenth of 11th graders smoke conventional cigarettes. According to the International Journal of Public Health, a study of e-cigarette and cigarette use among students in Hawaii, and the Journal of the American Medical Association, teens using e-cigarettes are two to eight times more likely to start smoking conventional cigarettes. I hope you'll consider my proposition to reclassify e-cigarettes as cigarettes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming up. Steve Stevens? Hi, Steve Stevens, Mora Bay resident. I, first of all, wanted to um, ask if you might be able to answer some of the questions. There are actually a limited number of questions here that are that were given to you. Frequently, you seem to uh, just ignore or don't have a, a, a sense of uh, them being a priority when citizens ask these questions here. Um, at the last meeting, uh, I requested the rationale for why we are paying two to three times a fixed rate attorney on staff how we end up with these kind of overruns, why we don't have some type of public ombudsman so that the council members themselves, who I'm sure are overwhelmed, are not aware of when there are overruns taking place. Uh, I'm appreciative of all the time and effort that, that is involved here. And uh, as the previous speaker said, I'm sure your intentions are are good, but there is a public benefit to you knowing the amount of money that is going out. And so it's kind of shocking to me that when I hear uh, the, anyone on the council be surprised about some of these figures, and I think it's kind of a foundation of how we ended up with a hundred and sixty seven million dollar project uh, again i I would suggest a public ombudsman in some capacity would be helpful just in terms of communicating to you directly. Thank you very much appreciate it thanks Steve i don 't have any more speaker slips. Is there anybody else for public comment seeing none i 'll close public comment and bring it back to council. Any comments or responses from council to my left or to my right? Red? Yeah, Mr. Mayen used two words, criminal and insane, to characterize the council. And I recognize that certainly he has the right to express his opinions, but um, that's simply not true, and I'm sorry that he said it, and I wish that he had not said it. Thanks, Red. Matt? Red? or excuse me, Marlis or John? Okay. I'll take a little, a little stab at some of the questions in regard to um, some of the financial questions. I would encourage you to visit our staff. 
Um, I understand some of you come to public comment and know you uh, that come to public comment and ask these. And I've asked for folks to visit our staff, and, and, and we don't get any um, folks that want to do that but would ra you know prefer to come to the council meeting to express that, which is fine. Um, some of the information about the billing for our city attorney, um, not accurate whatsoever. We approve, approve a budget every year, and we have fewer people in our budget process than we have in the audience tonight, which goes through every line item of our legal and everything else, as well as we have an auditor that goes through and audits everything. So um, that's in response to that. As far as uh, I just, I did want to respond to the MOU as a customer. Um, being at our joint meeting when uh, the city of Moore Bay uh, presented an MOU for Cayucas as a customer, um, which they um, weren't pleased with, um, the response was, well, maybe we would like Morro Bay to be a customer. Our response was, we may be open to that. And we actually, part of the, the direction was to have Cayuca staff and our city staff get together and work out an MOU that would be workable for both um, municipalities. And I'm looking at Rob because he was there and that he was tasked with that. Um, that's what we left the meeting with. And when our staff reached out to their staff, they refused to engage and work out an MOU that would be um, cooperative amongst both jurisdictions. I thank you kindly for bringing up an MOU for us to be a customer. I don't think we've ever said no to, to Cayucas. Um, but clearly that's where it is. So I think for the record, I think that needs to be clear. I, I, I understand, there, I hear the things about personalities and whatnot. I, I, the door has been open. It takes two. Uh, I, would, I would invite you to perhaps visit Cayucas as well and ask the same questions. Um, those are my comments. And with that, we'll move on to consent. Um, and I'm looking for speaker slips for consent. Anybody for public comment for consent? Seeing none, um, I'll move on to co consent. And I'd like to pull item A4. Are there any items to pull? Seeing none, um, I take a motion to approve all items on the ad agenda except for item A4. So, so moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Motion by Mr. Heading and a second by Mr. Davis. And. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries. 5-0. Um, item A4, um, I just wanted to, item A4 is adoption of resolution number 4717. This is approving an amendment um, to the new lease agreement between the city of Moore Bay and the Boatyard LLC. I just wanted to bring up on page 22 of 181 under section 3.01, uh, particularly under permitted uses, and um, uh, oh, about two-thirds down in the paragraph uh, where it, it says uh, botels, botels and dock slips. Um, specifically, um, this is in part of the contract. I was just pulling this item to discuss and request council to consider striking that. Um, I think at the time of the initial um, uh, agreement for this, uh, we had not heard uh, another item that came before council that had a concept that discussed Botels, to which we um, had input from the community and the Harbor Advisory Board, um, and we don't have a policy that supports Botels, so um, I would just um, ask council um, to um, consider my request to strike Botels and dock slips um, as part of this agreement, and unless there's any other discussion, that's that's my point on the contract, and if the, unless there's no discussion, I would just take a motion to approve as amended. I move we approve um, item A4 as amended by removing boat tails and box slips from the bo boat slips from the uh, contract. Uh, dock slips. Dock. Boat tails and dock slips. Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> second. All right, we have a motion by Ms. McPherson, second by Mr. Heading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries 5 0. That concludes our consent. And with that, Hang on a minute. I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping here.
next item on the agenda, item C1, adoption of resolution number 4517, uh, amending the council, council policies and procedures to eliminate the 7 p.m. start time for public hearings and consideration of council subcommittee to review the council policies and procedures and advisory board bylaws. This is continued from our previous meeting, and um, I'll start that out and look to our city clerk to introduce the item, and uh, we'll go for discussion. Thanks. Sure. I will make this quick. The purpose of this item is to address two council declared future agenda items. On February 14th, 2017, uh, the council requested its discussion of the council policies and procedures, particularly related to advisory boards and specifically to include discussion of advisory board training. Then on May 9th, um, the council requested discussion of meeting structure regarding the 7 p.m. start time for public hearings. Staff's recommendation is for the council to, to discuss and consider resolution 4517, amending section 1.2.7 of the council policies and procedures to eliminate the 7 p.m. start time for public hearing items, and to consider establishing a council subcommittee to work with staff to review the council policies and procedures and advisory board bylaws in their entirety to consider possible revisions to those documents and bring recommendations back to the council for consideration. Just a little bit of background, the council policies and procedures and advisory board bylaws were um, adopted in 2001 and 2002 respectively. They have um, been updated several times but have never been reviewed in their entirety. Based on a brief review, um, the mayor and I conducted several areas were identified for potential updates and we agreed that a more thorough review and development of draft language is warranted. If the council desires, resolution 4517 addresses the issue of eliminating the 7 p.m. start time for public hearings and you may consider and discuss whether you'd like to establish a subcommittee to do the complete review. Okay, thanks for thanks very much, Dana. Appreciate that. So, um, thanks, Dana, for coordinating and working out the, the staff report and all the items that were presented. Um, as far as getting started uh, for discussion on this, I'm looking for public comment slips on this item. I don't have any public comments um, slips for this. Does anybody like to speak to this? Seeing none, are there any further questions? Are there any questions from council on this, or do you want to go into discussion? Matt, go ahead. Dana, are, in terms of the start time at 7 p.m. that we have now, do we have any sort of, um, besides precedent of when this was passed, um, would you say 2000, 2001, is there any sort of criteria for precedent saying that the meeting should um, start at whatever time? The staff report that established that criteria wasn't available, so I don't know what the history is on that item. And so in, in usual or due course, do municipalities, they just, are, it's up to each yeah. municipality to set these meetings, so there's no necessary uh, um, standard? In reviewing other sit local cities, I did not find that requirement. Um, got it. And so any sort of criteria that a council, it comes up, it's either coming from the public and or, okay, got it. It's, inter it's internally driven. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Marlos? Okay, John? Okay, great, thanks. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, Dana. Um, I might ask our esteemed interim city manager if uh, it was the practice at his city, uh, or the two cities that he was in, or three or four, um, but the last one in particular, um, if that uh, policy was in place, if so, why, if not, why not? And uh, your opinion about a seven o'clock start time and the rationale for that. I'm happy to say more Bay is my seventh city I've served in, and this is the only city I know that has a specific time for public hearings to occur. Normally by resolution, the council establishes the time of a, of a public meeting to start, but not when certain sections of the public hearing or what have you are discussed. And I also asked our city attorney if he knew of a city that had a requirement like this. and. I don't want to answer for you, Joe, but I think his answer was no. There's no to say he knows of but more obey that uh, has a requirement the public hearing start after 7 p.m. 
And I believe um, it's my understanding, at least from one historian that sent an email that the original um, um, policy was established to make a time certain available for members that wanted to uh, participate in that public hearing to be available and to know when um, the hearing started so that they could plan on being at the meeting. Is that correct from a historical standpoint? Head nod, yes? Yeah. That seems reasonable, yes. <laughs> Thank you. No other? Okay. I'm, I'm not going to get, I don't have any other questions, but ready to get into a discussion. Since we don't have any pub public uh, uh, speaker slips, then um, I'll lead off into some discussion and, and ask for some feedback on this. Um, as far as the 7 o'clock start time, I thanks for the feedback on that. I'm sitting on the SLOCOG board, and, and I am familiar with the email correspondence that we received um, on behalf of the kind of the history and the start time at 7 o'clock, but um, great to um, measure ourselves with other municipalities and, and other cities on that. And I know on the SLOCOG board we have public hearing so it was as well. So for the listening audi audience, the SLOCOG, San Luis Obispo Council of Governments, a, a county transportation board which I sit and other board, other council members sit on uh, different uh, um, county boards as well. But public hearing items aren't necessarily set at a time. Um, as an example, with SLOCOG, the meeting starts at regularly at 8.30 in the morning. If there's a public meeting, hearing um the, you know it's just expected that the person shows up at the beginning at 8:30, and then when it the public hearing starts they're ready for that um so i, I and i know we've kind of bounced around on this and it's for some people they didn't even know there was a seven o'clock start time um i think we can continue to post it as a public hearing item and it would be um the expectation that right after consent we would get to our public hearing item and we wouldn't necessarily have to worry about taking a pause as an example if we concluded right now we would have to either wait 10 minutes to get to that item or we would do what frequently do is move to our next item which we would get to and then maybe at 7.30 we would get to our public um, hearing uh, just to keep the flow of things going. So um, I, I don't feel as though it's going to inhibit um, public input. Um, the expectation would people would be here for the, the 6 o'clock start time for a public hearing. Those are my comments on that. And then um, I did want to uh, get into, I'll just cover a couple items and then open up for discussion. The resolution number 7015, which is um, in our which was a resolution that was passed, and it's actually in in the vets hall on the back door. Um, this is a resolution of the City of Council of the City of Moore Bay pledging to follow best practices and civility and civil discourse in all of its meetings. Um, this was adopted in um, 2015. I would just ask that we, um, following discussion, when we bring back these council policies and procedures for any changes that we bring back this resolution and reaffirm it by a new adoption and I say that because um, this was a, approved and adopted by a previous council and it was actually approved on a 3-2 vote to being absent and I think it would be relevant for a new council to reaffirm this and to actually have all five council members have the um, the ability to affirm this with a 5-0 um, support so that would be one of my requests as we move forward in reviewing some of the policies and procedures which is I think a, a great um, um, base for us to have as part of our um, guidelines for our policies and procedures and then um, also would support the, the subcommittee um, and looking for, for members that would want to volunteer for that and um, those are those are my discussion items and unless we wanted to get into any other discussion items that have been recommended in the staff report I'll stop there and and uh, I'll look to my left um, red if you wouldn't mind starting us off in uh, another in your um, discussion thanks um, I'm just gonna say that I agree with what's been said before and uh, and I support reviewing the uh, the policies and procedures in the bylaws and I would like to adopt the resolution to dispense with a time certain for the beginning of the public hearings 
And I do like your idea about civility. I'm in favor of civility. Thank you. All right. Okay, Matt. Um, I too, um, I think in terms of the, um, the recommendation and the subcommittee, the one item that I am um, a little bit leery or, or concept that I'm leery or careful about is that there are sometimes that I mean, it's kind of a it's kind of a, 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 a give and take. We have folks that can't necessarily make the start time always, but they can't necessarily stay for the uh, meeting that's laid on the agenda. So there's a natural tension to have things move along at a, at a timely um, pace and also at a night and at a decent time. Um, I wonder, in terms of if we do away with the seven o'clock um, mandate for this, um, should we? put into some sort of consideration that, um, and I don't know how we would do this, we would say in the future, some items we could declare a later start time if there was public um, need for that. Um, I don't know, I, maybe I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking that we have, and I've heard over the, a number of years people say, this, we like this consistent start time. Um, some people do say it's too late. Some people say it goes, but however, that consistency knowing um, or with our residents knowing that they can come at a particular time and hear things, that's, you know, trustworthy, consistent. So I, I don't, I understand what you're saying, Red and, and Jamie, your points of, um, you, that you're making. Um, and I like the resolution in, in terms of the subcommittee also, but I'm also very um, careful about that start time. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. John? Thank you. Um, I agree with uh, Council Member uh, Makowski, and you know, it, I just historically thinking back to the meetings um, that we've had, where we've had seven o'clock mandated start times. Um, um, it seems to me a majority of the times we have um, uh, gotten to uh, the item sooner, uh, or because of uh, finishing other agenda items up or consent uh, calendar items and had to wait um, an inordinate amount of time. Um, thusly, we've started other agenda items ahead of that, which actually pushed the uh, seven o'clock start time to a later time because of the fact that we were in the middle of another agenda item. But I, I do think it important to um, try to prioritize that from an agenda setting, setting standpoint. Uh, and the policy has been that the mayor and the city manager and now um, the mayor pro tem is with that group in setting um, the agenda for the city council that we could do it by addressing the policies and procedures and making that a priority item um, through policy um, as an agenda item that would be set not by time but priority up front. And so my suggestion would be that um, we, um, or I would support, I, I say, uh, eliminating the 7 p.m. start time, but um, looking at establishing a policy within the policy review to um, move that time routinely um, to one of the first, if not the first, agenda item after consent. So, and I would support the subcommittee as well. Marlis? Yes. Um, well, I also agree that I, I don't think we need to have a 7 o'clock start time. And it was my understanding that we do have a pretty established um, agenda and that the public hearing always comes, it's the first item after consent. So I think the public should be quite aware of exactly how we're proceeding with the meeting and can judge accordingly when they need to be here. Um, and it's going to be, uh, am I right that we usually do or mm -hmm. almost, yep. is it in the policy? It is, as it is that's now. That's what I it's, thought. It was that's actually <laughs> in our policies and procedures. So we do have a set agenda. And so I don't think it's necessary to have a start time. And I do remember times when we had to adjust the uh, agenda around and then we couldn't start the public hearing at 7. And so it got to be later. So it's not a definite time. It's... If you have to move it around you, it's whenever it comes up next. So it's much better to follow the agenda, I think, and not switch. Um, I know that I received some criticism for our last meeting when we switched around the marijuana discussion. So I know that the public does not like that. They want us to follow the agenda. So I would um, absolutely uh, agree and support um, changing the policies to, uh, so we do not have a definite start time for the public hearings. Um, I was the one that uh, have been very concerned about advisory board training. 
and have kind of pushed it because I did serve on two advisory boards, and I know that you come into that position without a very good understanding of your role, your responsibilities, and even though there is some Brown Act training, um, I know that we would like to have our advisory boards kind of follow the procedure that the council follows. And I w had the question of, does, does, do the advisory boards know about our rules of civility, which they're also supposed to follow? So I see a lot of areas where I think we could have training. And uh, I think we could also look at our agenda to see how we might be able to tighten things up. I, I don't like going past 11, so if there's any way that we could streamline, so I'm, I'm happy to look at uh, the policies and I would volunteer to be on the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I just, for, um, I just passed out uh, copies to council and I have one um, for our city clerk as well. Um, this is just information and there's some in the back. Thank you, Dana. Um, this is, uh, I brought this up at our mayor's meeting, um, was asking different cities on what they do for advisory board training, and Pismo Beach was kind enough to send a, a training um, outline that they have for their advisory board. So um, that's a start, um, I think, for um, a potential subcommittee, if that's where we want to go, we can start with this and, and maybe um, have those discussions. So um, there are other um, avenues and um, things available for us to um, f to work with on, on training, which I, I would support. And I think when we first started this agenda item, we, we talked specifically about um, the 7 o'clock start time and then also training. And so I'll just um, comment on the 7 o'clock start time in that for the most part, we're pretty darn close to the 7 o'clock start time. We're, I would say, um, within you know, 10 minutes of our that 7 o'clock start time. Uh, you know, on rare occasion, do we get it at set, at 6.30? Uh, like I said, m from my experience, most people in the audience don't know that there's a 7 o'clock start time. Um, and I think the order of business, if it's laid out there, um, I th you know, I think we should just, it, there, you know, that order of business says, you know, it's in there that that's where, what the item is first on the agenda, public hearing, and we can follow that. So that'll guide us there. Um, I think, you know, most, you know, the feedback we get from community members that are looking to provide input, I think council's been pretty um, open to um, being able to to make make adjustments. But, you know, there are public hearing items where we have, um, you know, folks that will be, um, you know, perhaps waiting to, to speak for that too. I, 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 um, I think no different than slow cog or other cities the meeting starts at six o'clock and you know the order of business is so on and and the expectation is if we're going to have a public meeting public hearing it'll be the first thing item on the agenda and they would be here at six o'clock six o'clock ready to normal course of business as we've heard from our um, city manager and, and city attorney on on what what the course of business is and and as well as um, what happens at uh, other cities so um, I would support the resolution to adopt um, to eliminate the seven o'clock start time and um, and then also support um, the subcommittee um, I, 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 I didn't hear anybody particularly volunteer for the, the subcommittee, Marlis, um, or, or anybody else. Um, since nobody else did, I, I would uh, volunteer for that, uh, since I um, was one of the agendizers of this. Um, and um, unless there's any other discussion, we um, uh, particularly about on page 28 of 180, 181, where there's some there's a list of 12 items to consider, um, and certainly the subcommittee can move forward by considering what's listed in our staff report. Uh, unless there's um, um, any other discussion, I think it's a worthwhile discussion as far as um, um, the the length of the meetings and the end time. I, I know we have those discussions quite a bit. Um, I think, you know, following setting the agenda, we have those discussions as well, um, trying to figure out what's the presentation time. Um, Dana had a, a very brief uh, presentation, and, you know, as part of that as well, sometimes our presentations, depending on the topic, obviously we had a presentation for Slow Cal, uh, probably a little bit over the 10 minute mark, um, but as we get into that, if there's feedback from council and want to have those discussions, certainly open for that as well. 
Ready to make a motion? We did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would move that um, council adopt resolution number 45-17 amending section. Forgot to slow down. 1.27 of the council policies and procedures to eliminate the 7 p.m. start time requirement for public hearings, period. I also recommend the establishment of a subcommittee consisting of Mayor Irons and Council Member McPherson to work with staff to review the council policies and procedures and advisory board bylaws in their entirety, consider the possible revisions discussed in the staff report and any others deemed necessary and return to council with proposed revisions for consideration and adoption period. Second. Motion by Mr. Heading, second by Ms. McPherson. Any questions or um, conversation with that one? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries 5-0. And that concludes item C2 of the agenda. And next next order of business on the agenda is uh, item C2, consideration of approval of conditional co consent of landowner pertaining to the request for proposals award on lease site 87-88 um, and 8788 W, which is located at 833 Embarcadero. This is um, known as off the hook to the TLC um, family enterprises. And um, this item, looking to Eric to start us off on this. Thank you and good evening, Mayor Irons and Council. I will do my best to endeavor. We don't have to invoke the go past 11 o'clock rule here tonight. Second. <laughs> um, so as you stated, as you have before you, you know, consideration of a consent of landowner to TLC um, in the RFP process to redevelop the off the hook lease site. Our purpose here tonight is to obtain council consent of landowner approval to TLC Family Enterprises for the proposal to redevelop the site. Also to obtain other council input and guidance as necessary on TLC's current proposal and information they provided. And thirdly, obtain council guidance regarding management of the lease site after the current lease expires at the end of March next year. Uh, because if we continue to move forward with this process and consent of landowners granted, obviously the site's not going to get rebuilt before that lease expires, so we have to address that. And then if TLC's proposal is approved, it'll be submitted to Scott and his community development folks and go through the full public process of planning commission and, and city council concept approval and on to um, Coastal Commission every, and all the other places. So um, on your dais, I provided you a TLC business plan that was recently provided um, from Sharice and Travis. It's in front of you. There's also a few copies I think Dana put in the back. So that's some additional information recently provided. Uh, as far as our recommendations, we recommend the uh, um, review of the updated proposal from TLC and the staff report as well and um, staff's analysis, consider granting the consent of landowner, I'm going to call it COL approval um, of TLC's redevelopment proposal. Unfortunately, there's going to be a fair amount of acronyms here tonight. Um, direct staff to execute the COL agreement as presented and provide staff guidance as I spoke earlier on management of the lease site after the lease's current, uh, current lease's expiration. Alternatives are do not grant um, COL approval to CLC and direct staff to work with Central Coast Investments, which is CCI, on their redevelopment proposal. As you will recall, CCI was one of the three original proposers in the process um, who stayed into the process, which I'll get to here in a second, um, and they entertain their proposal. Alternative number two would be do not grant COL approval to TLC or CLI and direct staff to bring back a new request for proposals on the site or other process. As far as fiscal impacts goes, there will be no fiscal impacts until about 2021 when the site actually gets under redevelopment if we continue forward in this process. There will be negative impact during redevelopment. Obviously, the place is going to be um, all in likelihood scraped to the ground. Um, we'll go to some sort of a minimum rent in that meantime, about a year in construction, and then once they get up, started, once they get up and starting, it'll take a while for the um, revenues to be regenerated. So there will be some neg negative um, impacts during redevelopment. The current, current minimum rent on the site is about $32,000 per year. Um, so like I said, we'd probably go to some um, negotiated rent um, in the interim time. After redevelopment, it's estimated there'd be about an $80,000 a year increase in Harbor Fund revenues, mainly because we've got addition of hotel units. Currently as it is, it's got retail and restaurant. 
Um, the proposal in front of you has retail restaurant and hotel. Um, so you'd see some increase in revenues because of the, mainly the hotel. The general fund revenues, and these aren't an increase from current levels, these are just estimated off of um, what their projected gross income would be. Um, general fund revenues of about $66,000 a year. That would include sales tax and transient occupancy tax, which I did not break up into individual groups. This is a total. About 9000 a year in Measure Q revenues, because those are a discrete number that comes off of um, sales tax. And then about $14,000 in new T-bid revenues, another discrete number that you can calculate pretty easily. And, again, and those are new revenues on T-bid because of the hotel being an addition, uh, additional element that we don't have currently. The background, as I stated earlier, this lease expires at the end of March 2018. Um, September 13th of 2016, Council reviewed and accepted the three redevelopment proposals submitted to the RFP process. The proposers were direct directed to refine and revise their proposals and bring them back for reconsideration. Only two proposals came back, um, again, from TLC and CCI, Central Coast Investments, and they were reviewed by Council on April 11th, 2017. There was Council consensus to move forward with the TLC proposal and bring back for future count future council review and approval, refined revised proposal for the staff analysis and the consent of landowner COL with discrete performance measures and project milestones. And that's what we have tonight. Of primary interest on April 11th in bulleted um, elements here were uh, number one, address any further council input on building or site design. Number two, 10 year um, financial pro forma from TLC an analysis of that pro forma and, and revision of that pro forma. Number three, further vetting of the food court concept of their restaurant style as opposed to the um, formal sit-down dining. Number four, further vetting of TLC's financial backing, their financial commitment they have to build the project. Number five, the contribution to the approved Centennial and or Market Plaza concept designs, um, which occur on the hill above and, and walking down into the waterfront. Number six, uh, no phasing of the land and water improvements, in other words, construction of both at the same time. And finally, performance measures and project milestones in the consent of landowner agreement form itself. Um, TLC did provide an updated 10-year financial pro forma, which is in your staff report as attachment number one. And again, that business plan that was just provided today is in front of you as well. Of the 10 numbered items, or the seven, sorry, the seven numbered items I just went through, I'll go in detail on those now. Um, I did report in the original staff report that no, um, Director Graham was the one to receive any additional council um, input on the building and site design type elements. I mistakenly reported in the staff report that uh, Mr. Graham had received none, no such um, input. He did receive some input from Councilman um, Davis. Um, Bullard pointed out here um, that open and unfettered views to the water through the 30% view corridor with no outdoor furniture exceeding 30 inches in height be provided. Benches and tables clearly identified as being available to the public and not necessarily having to purchase anything. Um, attractive landscaping to the maximum extent possible and parking spaces across the street, uh, much like we recently did for Rose's Landing to made available for hotel guests between 6 p.m. and 10 a.m. Um, these things I would add that would be pretty much a given that they're gonna be required in the waterfront master plan that's what's been included in all recent developments. So those would get included into that process um, should it go forward. On to the 10-year pro forma analysis. Um, staff looked at TLC's revenue and expense projection data um, against market data, industry standards, benchmarks. Um, while there's always gonna be some outliers and some lack of detail, um, in some their projections do appear sound. Um, I did, in my math, I got a little bit off of my math in there. TLC's in the, in the first chart there in your staff report on page 121 of the council item. Um, reported TLC's pro forma showed 2170500 in total gross income. That's actually 2372940 so almost 2400000 So um, somewhere in my math went a little bit wrong, but essentially what I did on, on my end is before I really looked at their pro forma, I took their square footage of the three business lines, the retail, the restaurant, and the hotel, went into our percent gross reporting that we've gotten from our waterfront tenants, um, combined or compared like type operators over a three year period of averages and came up with a per square foot per year likely revenue generating capacity for those square footages and calculated them out. And I, I arrived at the figure, um, again, is, is what you have in your staff report is about 2,300,000. 
Um, they're at 2,373,000, so not far off um, the numbers I use from known um, waterfront producers on our waterfront. Um, conclusion, um, in terms of the um, revenues, $2 million is a pretty sound number, I believe, to be used for what that site could generate, given what is being proposed. Um, it's conservative. It's not um, very, you know, it's not super wishful, but it's not doom and gloom either. It's somewhere in the middle, uh, but I think it's a good sound number to work with. Uh, and at this revenue level, the project as proposed appears solvent uh, based on the um, expense numbers that we received from TLC. And again, I used, you know, benchmarking and, and industry standards to try and um, analyze their numbers to see what they came with, came up with. As far as the food court analysis goes, further vetting of the food court, um, we have no direct waterfront comparators. Obviously, you, you go all over the, the state and, and country and you have food courts in all sorts of different locations of, of different styles and sizes and types. Uh, but we have nothing here on the waterfront. The closest informal self-serve-like comparators we have here in Morro Bay would probably be Hofbrau and Tognazine's Dockside where you go and pay and then go sit down and, and somebody either calls you and brings your food to you. Uh, much like what TLC is proposing. It's not a formal sit-down restaurant with waiters and waitresses. So um, don't have direct comparators, but those are close. Um, and there you have proven successful. Um, I used a, a lower per square foot revenue than traditional sit-down restaurants when I compared their restaurant style. Uh, but it still appears to be a financially viable model with the um, expense projections they provided. And a food court style, could family style, um, could provide a, a unique and affordable option that we don't have exactly on the waterfront. I refrain from using Giovanni's takeout window and Little Hut takeout window. Just they're very successful, um, but they're also um, pure takeout, um, more fast food oriented, um, and they've got a long established clientele and, and they've been there a long time. And I, I felt hesitant to use those, even though they're um, somewhat like they were. They were not like enough. I thought Half Brown, Tognazini's Dockside were the better comparators for that. As far as TLC's financial backing, um, they have funding $500,000 um, committed from Giovanni de Garamore, another waterfront operator here um, at Giovanni's, um, Central Coast Seafood. Um, we've got a letter of commitment on all these. We have you know, paperwork backing it up um, from the individuals. Um, three, $3 million loan commitment from a private lender, Midcoast Capital, um, Vincent Crooks. Mr. Crooks has uh, probably seen two or three projects that he's loaned over here on the waterfront over the years that I've been here. Um, so he knows the waterfront lending climate and has um, been willing and able to jump in in the past. About $100,000 private funding from a Charles Zimmerman and a letter of commitment for that. And Heritage Oaks, Heritage Oaks Banks, which from my understanding is Pacific Premier, they've, they're changing their name. Um, but anyhow, they've got a, a letter of um, expression of interest um, in an amount in terms to be determined depending on what the final cost projections are. Um, lenders typically aren't going to commit too much further than this um, until some sort of um, entitlement is in place, the consent of landowner being um, what Heritage Oaks would like to see in place to take it to the next level. Um, and then the $150,000 in TLC's funding with bank statements provided to show that they have some um, liquid cash on hand as well. So in sum, they've got about $650,000 to get to the concept approval stage, after which time a lease would be negotiated, assuming a, a suitable project was established and permitted to the concept um, level. At that point, a lender will go in because now they've got the a lease in place to, to ensure that the time of their lease um, term will be covered by the um, term of their loan will be covered by the lease. Um, if the loans are secured, it appears TLC will have financial capacity to understate the project. Um, obviously, there's a risk um, involved to, um, you know, speculative loan lending, whether a lender will, will lend or not. Uh, but that risk is primarily on the developer, on the tenant. Um, it's not on the city. Um, other potential lending uh, or funding sources could be bonding, lines of credit, um, pre-approvals, corporate guarantees, cash, things like that, um, all of which could be considered um, into the future once we get into the lease stage and want to establish our performance parameters in the lease, we could put performance parameters on the financing, financial backing as well. As far as participation in Centennial Market, Centennial Plaza Market um, contribution, um, TLC has expressed on many occasions, and there's uh, a letter included in the staff report, their willingness to commit building and or maintaining some 
portion of the concept plans for Centennial Market Plaza. Um, their hesitation lies in it's difficult to commit to anything from a dollar standpoint when you don't know what exactly the thing is you'd be committing to and what the dollar would be, dollar amount would be. Um, they're most interested in potentially in the, in the area, the, which is the current parking area between Libertines and Roses, um, which is part of the Centennial uh, concept project. And they continue to be a voice in the design and planning processes. They made comments in, in both of those processes as they moved forward. So um, Centennial Market, again, they're, they're willing and able to jump in. They just, without having some numbers, um, it's a little difficult for them to commit. As far as the development phasing, land and water, they're committed to proceeding both at the same time and process them all under one permit and get underway building so that there's not a lag on one side or the other. Uh, I think they'd initially proposed to do the water after the land. Um, council comments from April 11th was, eh, we'd like to see it all at once. So um, they're willing and able now to go through all at once. And finally, um, last but not least, the consent of landowner document itself. Um, I worked pretty closely with our um, community development director, Graham, with coming up with a, a plausible um, permit acquisition timeline without being too lax or too aggressive because I've seen too many things get behind schedule and then have to go in and extend them out and extend them out. So I, I wanted to be tight, but I didn't want to be too tight. Um, so I worked with Scott and we came up with um, a number of um, milestones that must be met in the consent of the landowner document, otherwise it would um, be rescinded. Um, the first would be um, financial letters of commitment or loan pre-approval, lines of credit. Um, by the end of this year, 123117, assuming consent of landowner is, is granted. Um, so you don't have to do a math. That's um, about four months from once they get consent of landowner approval. They'd have to file for a conditional use permit, CUP, by January 2nd, 2018. That's four months from getting consent to landowner approval, obtain concept plan approval by August 31st, 2018. That's eight months to obtain that. Um, again, a, uh, not a slow timeline, not a hurry up timeline, but somewhere comfortable in between. Uh, begin new, new lease negotiations as soon as concept approval is obtained. We can, as a matter of, of course, enter into a new lease until the sequel analysis has been done, which is typically done at concept approval. So once that analysis is done, we would, of course, be speaking with the tenant beforehand and working up to a lease so that we're not starting from ground zero once the plan, once concept approval is approved, or concept plans are approved, but we have a little bit of a head start, so that would be our intent there. And then a requirement to secure financing no later than 100 days, 120 days after the new lease's effectiveness. And file for con um, coastal development permit and other required permits. There's gonna be Army Corps, there's gonna be regional water, there will be others. They'd have to file for those permits by October 31st, 2018, which is two months from receiving concept approval, and obtain coastal development and other permits by April 30th, 2019. That's six months to obtain those permits. File for precise plan approval by the end of July of 2019. That's um, three months from conditional, um, from coastal development permit approval. Um, depending on how much, as you know, once you go to coastal, coastal can change what the city approved. Hopefully not, because we've been pretty good about getting with coastal into the concept phase of our projects to make sure coastal's on board with what we're doing so we don't send them something that they don't like. So that usually goes pretty smoothly, but that could change depending on what coastal does with the plans that are submitted to them. And then obtain precise plan approval by the end of November 2019. So that's four months to obtain that from the city and then file for building plans by February 28th of 2020, which is three months from precise plan approval, and then obtain their building permits in another three months by May 31st, 2020, and ta-da, commence construction by 8 31, 2020, which is three months from getting their building plans. So three months to get all their final stuff together and, and get moving. And then one year um, to get construction done. And depending on timing, that could slide, depending on whether you're high season, low season. So, uh, and all these could slide up um, you know, if the first one went a little quicker, then the second one moves up, third one moves up, and so forth, and so on. So um, that would be the consent of landowner document. And then a provision in the consent of landowner document that um, extensions to the deadlines could be granted um, upon approval by the city manager, if, upon the city manager's um, um, evaluation of that. In conclusion, uh, there's projects on similar scale and concept to other successful owner-operator waterfront redevelopments. Um, operation after redevelopment appears financially viable as proposed. 
um, from a business planning perspective, and again, you've received some more information tonight. Preliminary financial backing is in place. The only unknowns are whether or not that funding will follow the permit and lease approvals. And again, it's, it's always a risk um, whether or not that funding will follow. Um, however, the risk is primarily on the developer or on the tenant. It's not on the city for, uh, for them to get those approvals and for them to get that financing. Um, TLC has development team members and business partners, um, the architects we've seen, um, Giovanni Garamore, others, um, with the capacity to, to, loan, to plan, permit, and build and operate the project. Um, we requesting that the council consider granting um, TLC the conditional consent to land on approval and direct the city manager to execute that document if it's approved and again provide staff direction for lease site management after the current lease's expiration in 2018. Of the three options that we could go with there, one would be go into holdover on the existing lease with the existing master tenant until um, such a time that we were ready to execute a new lease with TLC. Um, another option would be for the city to take over the lease site completely and just have a building lease. We'd have a land and building lease and, and the existing tenants there would then become tenants of the city or go into a temporary lease, an interim lease with um, TLC, um, something that does have precedent. We've done it on several lease sites in the past that have gone into the same sort of situation where we go with the developer of choice and enter into a um, fairly short term, um, fairly simple lease that lapses when the new lease comes into play in a future time. And with that, I'll be quiet and entertain any questions. Okay, Eric, thanks very much. We have one speaker slip, but before that, we'll get into uh, questions um, for staff. And uh, John, you want to start us off with some questions? Um, thank you, Eric, for your presentation. Very much appreciate it. And um, Eric and I had a chance this morning to talk in detail, and um, you answered all of the questions I had of you as a staff member. My questions are mainly for the applicants, so I don't know, Mr. Mayor, at what point in time you'd like that, but um, I do have questions for the applicants. Okay, if you want to just, if we can just get through council questions, and then we'll Absolutely. have um, Sharice come up, and we can go through her public comment, and then we can ask any questions following the public comment. Did you, uh, yeah. did you want to continue on your question, John? Or? Uh, I can do that, yes. And as I said, um, Eric and I had a chance to speak this morning. I'll just maybe clarify a couple of items then. Um, could you tell me, in, in terms of the capital of funding um, and that you went over, um, that the applicants had indicated they had backing with, um, what documents do we have on file and um, what guarantees do we have of project funding or for project funding? As far as the lenders go, um, Heritage Oaks and Midcoast Capital have provided letters um, stating their interest in funding the project. Um, there is evidence in bank account statements provided by TLC of um, Giovanni de Garamore's financial commitment in terms of money that was deposited in TLC's accounts, um, as well as their own funding that they have, TLC has. Uh, but the others were letters of interest and letters of intent. Um, could you tell me comparatively um, with maybe other um, leaseholders on the Embarcadero now, um, granted the size of this project might be a little different, but um, comparatively if you looked at um, the revenue uh, generated to the city, um, how would this entity compare with um, other similar projects on a per unit basis? Um, and we may have, um, you know, at least two that are similar. Do you have any comparative information uh, in terms of expectations and performance? Well, again, I went into our percent gross reporting that we get every year and chose as like of businesses as I could um, on all three business lines, restaurant, retail, and hotel and averaged it out over the past three years and came up with a per square foot annualized basis. Um, so I, it was my opinion that that was our best comparator because that's what happens on our waterfront and those numbers are direct reporting to us. So I'm confident in those numbers that we generated that $2 million a year. If you look, you know, Anderson Inn and, and other sites left and right with restaurant, retail, hotel, um, their TLC's numbers aren't way outside of the box on either end. 
Uh, they fall somewhere in the middle there, and that's why I used an averaging over three years. Sometimes I went over back a, a few more years where I had some more data. Okay. Um, in, in the uh, staff report and the information provided by the applicant, the uh, document titled Master Lessee TLC Family Pro Forma, uh, that um, appears to be um, basically um, a, a statement of revenues and expenses for um, the applicant's business per se. Uh, and and then I noticed that on your page uh, 122, you put it into your own overall one-year performance, um, um, what I'd call income um, and expense statement, um, showing net profits um, of 213, 430 for retail, restaurant, and hotel, and then TLC net profits of 141 to 70. Did, did we get a chance to look at an overall 10-year pro forma that took into consideration all three of the entities as you've done here, um, as opposed to what we have on page, uh, what number is it, 129, which doesn't include things like um, uh, depreciation, um, amortization, um, uh, interest, et cetera. So the 10-year the analysis you see there are the numbers that we received from TLC on the, your page 129 and the master lessee TLC family pro forma um, that show their total rents and then their expenses with a net cash flow. Um, that Correct, I did plug their numbers into my analysis on page 122. Um, in developing my staff report and doing my analysis of their numbers, once I, I finished with my numbers, I did work back and forth with TLC, and I had identified several items that appeared either missing or outside what I would call benchmarking or market data, and that they then went back in and revised. Um, yeah, do they have every single you know, 15, 16, whatever number items on there? No, they don't. Um, it's, it appeared to me they did a good job at, at catching the major items. The big ticket items that you've got to worry about um, and with some administrative on there as well. And then I plug those into the annual $2 million comfortable gross revenue, pulled out the expenses on hotel, restaurant, retail to show what those three entities in some total could expect to see as a, as a net profit and then TLC as a master lessee managing those. A couple of those business lines of which they will manage. They're going to manage the hotel and all if not part of if not all of the retail on their own and the restaurant will be subtenant so their revenue kind of gets mixed in as a as a master tenant and a subtenant that okay. your question uh, somewhat yes but that's i think i've got it uh, uh, on on the total rents um, again i'm on page 122 excuse me 129 of your um Report, which is the master lessee TLC family pro forma, um, the total rents in terms of um, the dollars that are there, do they include the applicant paying rent to themselves? Yeah, that's one of the things we discussed this morning. Um, yes, it does. So, um, while well, they're going to operate the hotel and some, if not all, the the retail, um, obviously for tax and other reasons, they'll be charging themselves rent. Um, be able to take advantage of the write-offs and whatnot. So yeah, the total rents listed on the page on page 129 and their family pro forma for year one, which is really what I focused on was year one. Um, years on out from that are just a CPI um, um, benchmark after that. So on year one, their total rents of 429, 270 do include rent that the hotel would be paying to the master tenant, one and the same entity. So in other words, um, paying themselves with their own revenue, which is really an expense to them individually. Okay. Um, and then um, I guess my last question would be on debt service. Do you have any idea what the debt service number includes, or should I save that for the applicant? I'd probably say save that for the applicant. I did question them on that, and, and um, I don't have that data right in front of me. I'm sure they do, but... Um, they looked at we looked at commercial rates and, and their numbers seemed appeared reasonable for what's going on right now. And of course, you know, in a year anything can change. It could go up, could go down. Um, over a certain amount of time, I think they did over a 30 year period, and and the number they use in there for debt service, 200,000, is I think cushioned a little, I'll let them answer. Cushioned a little bit on the high side, but that was their debt service number for quotes that they had gotten um, from their potential lenders. 
Um, and uh, I'll just, I did have one more question, I guess. Uh, I did ask the applicant for a business plan and a marketing plan, which I did receive late this afternoon. Had you received that prior to tonight? Was there anything that you had the opportunity to review in terms mm -hmm. of a business plan or no, a what, marketing plan? No, what I relied on was the original submission from TLC um, last year, or I guess the year before at this point, um, which had more detail in it, and then their most recent submission, and then talking to them. Um, discussion with them. No, I, when you, it came from your questions um, as of, I guess, the email you sent this morning and then right. they, they, or last night, and they put together that uh, pro forma, and, and I just got it this afternoon as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Marlis? Uh, thank you, Eric. I actually did send Eric a list of questions um, earlier today, and he was kind enough to respond to me. So, um, And some of my questions, I think, are probably better put to the applicant as well. Uh, I did have some questions about um, the food service, especially, and the food court, and if it's a single restaurant that's uh, t with takeout food. I noticed that in your analysis, you had separated out food court and restaurant, and they combined them. And so I I would, just was unclear about how many different uh, restaurants might be in this food court, but I can ask the applicant those questions. Um, I was also curious, and maybe you could just respond briefly to, does the city have any influence over um, the type of restaurants that we have leases for? Typically not, no. We, we let the market decide what goes in there. The, the control we have is over the tenants we put in place. We do, I mean, I guess I, I'll qualify that. Um, let's say TLC continues on with this process um, and they're going to have, and I think one of the answers to your question, and I'll get back to it, how many other restaurateurs they have in there, I think it's somewhere between three and five, but I'll let them answer. Let's say there's three um, subtenants are going to have different types of food in the food court. Those would require sublease approval, which is a, a city approval process. Would we look and go, hmm, Chinese food. I'm not sure he wants Chinese food. Why don't you try for something else? I doubt it. That we're going to let them decide what they want to serve up. Right, um, but if, if they wanted a fast food restaurant in there, for example, would we have any say on that? Do we have any kind of... Uh... We could. I think, do we currently, and I'm looking in the back of Scott's head, um, isn't our... <laughs> do we currently have um, fast food as a drive-up or limited to a certain place in town? Like Burger King and McDonald's, is there anything that in our muni code that stipulates they can or can't go anywhere? That'd be tough. <laughs> okay. Can you can you speak closer into the mic, Scott? Please for everybody. Thanks. And to answer Councilmember McPherson, your, the other part of your question, um, in terms of the different styles that are going, their 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 restaurant is a food court style. There is a, a separate they're calling it a yogurt window. It's um, you know a frozen yogurt window that they've got combined in with their total restaurant sales for their for their food service total gross revenue. Where I separated them out because in my analysis, I deemed that the food court style would potentially earn different revenue than the yogurt window style. I, on the yogurt window, I went with um, some of our candy and, and food vendors and used the a per square foot analysis of that. So my, my, I separated them out where the, um, TLC did not separate them. So that's where the two differences in style. There's not a food court restaurant style and a regular sit down restaurant style. Okay. Councilmember uh, McPherson, may I just add something to to the discussion on the type of restaurant. Um, from a land use entitlement perspective, remember you have two roles here. You have a land use entitlement uh, governmental authority and then you have a landlord relationship. Um, although there may not be anything in your code that specifically says what kinds of restaurants can be in certain places, you as a landlord can write whatever you want into your lease. 
and sometimes you can write in price points of cer certain amounts of, of revenue have to be generated per uh, like a thirty dollar per meal price point um, certain things to add to require uh, sit down um, tablecloth type or fast food or whatever so you, you have that ability to do that again you'd want to do that with the market in mind so you don't want to require something that the market isn't going to allow. No, but it could be something that we would negotiate with um, TLC, for example. Talk Correct. about it and get a better understanding of what they, and have a discussion about it. Correct. All right, thank you. Um, and then I was also interested in this uh, short-term lease idea, and I'm wondering if you had, uh, first of all, who is currently responsible for that lease site, which is in not very good condition at the present time? The current master tenant is CCI, Central Coast Investments, slash Madeline Moore, the proprietor of Central Coast Investments. So if we wanted to have it cleaned up now before the lease is out, we would have to Correct. It would be on. It is on the existing master tenant. Okay. Uh, and if we were to negotiate a short-term lease with TLC, um, could we put conditions on there about that lease site in the interim period because it's going to be three years before there's anything else there? So it would be Certainly nice. We could put whatever we want. I think um, TLC. I have had that discussion with TLC. You know, what are the possibilities? moving into the future and, and I think they may be able to speak to that what they might intend okay. to do. Okay. And did you have did you have a recommendation on on to the make to the council on on uh, how we should proceed on that issue? Yeah, I would I would recommend that if COL consent to landowners granted TLC, we do a short term lease with TLC and allow them to take over and they're already an existing subtenant there and take over the rest of it and and and, and partly to um, so that we get a short-term lease in place and they can start moving forward in that direction under that lease, but also as um, sort of a test case to see how they perform and see how they do. Okay. But, but just, just to be clear, that takeover wouldn't be until March of 2018. Right. Correct. No, I understand. Oh, yeah, when the current lease expires. Um, and let me see. Would it be reasonable for us to at least suggest some level of financial commitment to the Centennial um, Parkway project? I, I understand that we don't have a dollar figure on what it's going to cost, but I'm just wondering if it's reasonable to expect at least a, a minimum amount of a dollar figure to contribute to it? That is one way to approach it. We did something similar with Tognazini's Dockside and Krill Saltwater Taffy for the Harbor Walk. Um, Harbor Hut and Gafco had to pay a, a per linear foot amount. In in the Harbor in the um, Krill Saltwater Taffy and Tognazini's leases, there was a flat dollar amount that said, "You can either pay this flat amount um, should the city build it, or you can go build the the walkway yourself." And so that is a precedent there. So that is one avenue to possibly take. And what happens if the milestones, I, I, you've sort of answered this, but um, what happens if the milestones aren't met? Um, if the milestones aren't met, then the COL is withdrawn. Unless there's some negotiation and there's some clear reason, is that correct? And Yeah, I mean, if it's what's commonly called force majeure, things completely outside of their control, let's say the coastal process, Coastal Commission process, where we've given them, I think, what is it, six months or eight months, um, something really wacky happens in Coastal and, and it, Takes by one. no fault of their own, kicks them into, into overtime on that, we would evaluate that. Uh, basically, every item on the draft consent to landowner document has um, stipulation, um, you know, shall be performed on or before date certain or this consent to landowner agreement will expire on January 1st. So if you don't do it by December 31st, January 1st it expires. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Matt? Eric, I have a couple questions. Um, first, let's start off with um, the length of the lease. Given the work that um, TLC is talking about doing on this site, um, do we do it all 2021? They started in 2022. What, kind of, what length of lease are we talking about? Based on historic um, leasing with other redevelopments, it's probably somewhere between 40 and 50 years. Okay. Um, 
then with that, and I know that we've looked at over the last year, year, and look at some of the preliminary plans in terms of the harbor walk. You're bringing up the, the idea of the harbor walk. That is part of the project that would go in front of the existing structure, and when they build that new structure, and that would then link up at some time with whatever happens with the Libertine, et cetera. Yeah, affirmative. They're they're proposing, and they would be required to put the 10-foot harbor walk on the backside, widen out the sidewalk to the, the requirement that it's supposed to be. So, yeah, it would. Obviously, it's going to line up on the on the north side with boat yards because they've got existing walkway. It's it's not an overhanging walkway. Theirs is um, boat yards is is on solid ground, so it would be, have to be designed to mate up with that. So you have a nice clear ten foot path all the way around. And then likewise on the east side on the Embarcadero, the the sidewalk would be widened there, or somehow that it. Um, how would that would work? Yeah, well, that the existing building is going to be scraped. It's going to go away, and they're going to have to set back. I want to say. Eight feet. Yep, Scott's nodding north and south. So, um, yeah, they'd have to have a minimum eight foot side, which I believe is what, you know, when they initially provided their proposal, they had looked at the, the general waterfront master plan stuff. And as you recall, we sent them back to the drawing board for a few items. Um, but they definitely need the eight foot sidewalk on the street side as well. Okay. And so, and then back to uh, Marla's kind of mentioned it in terms of the consent of landowner. If we go through this process and they're going and they don't necessarily meet the criteria met, do they then, because they're talking about, I think, the $600,000, $650,000 for this first stage of their planning, <clears throat> so then they would, wouldn't um, satisfy and then they would be out that, they would lose that money? Is that how it works? Well, the, the 650000 I identified as basically cash they have on hand to get them uh, startup funds, whatever you want to call it for them, to start through the planning and permitting process, at which point once they get permitted um, and get a new lease in place, then the, the lenders can do actual loans. So that 650 is their, their basically their, their funding available right now to get started. Um, yeah, if, if they get to a certain point um, and can't get through concept approval, the costs incurred are their costs. There's nothing on the city. If they get through concept approval and can't get a new satisfactory lease negotiated for whatever reason, which is what occurred on um, this site actually with Libertine as well when there was the joint proposal with Mr. Caldwell and Mr. Redican, they got all the way through Coastal Commission approval and, and they in the city, I wasn't managing the leases at that time, they in the city couldn't come to terms on a new lease. I don't know if it was between them and the city or between themselves and that fell by the wayside. So that's the risk is theirs, and whatever costs they incur up to that point are going to be all theirs. Um, are, there, are there parameters or concessions made in this agreement? I'm thinking of the seawall, and I know I've asked this question in the past in terms of the integrity of the seawall on that property. But knowing that the properties to the north are that seawall is suspect, and so if something happens and they get through the process or the project and they find out that um, they're going to need to put a lot more money into it, um, how does that work itself into the, um, the lease? They're going to need to do a full engineering assessment of that wall to put the building they want to put on top of it, and that'll go through, through Scott's folks and go through that whole design process. And if there's any flaws or any problems with that wall, it's going to get should get it's going to get i'm not gonna say it should get it's going to get caught in that in that engineering analysis process and if it if it adds on some crazy cost um to their their estimated i think their estimation right now is about three million dollars 3.2 million dollars if for some reason that wall needs another you know million and a half dollars worth of work i would suspect they're going to want to come back to the table and say hey we've got to have another million and a half dollars worth of work here let's talk about this so um, right now we don't suspect anything knock on wood but that would be addressed um, if once they do the engineering. Okay. Last question, Joe, this is um, for you. In terms of the promissory notes that they have from the various um, entities that um, saying that they could loan th um, them money for this project, are those satisfactory? They're not, they're not promises. They're letters of intent. So at this stage, it's sufficient. But as we get further along in the lease negotiations, we'd want to get something more firm as the letters of commitment from those people. And then those letters of commitment do have... Um, Certainty. Okay, and then likewise, there's a, are there's a time parameters to do that as the, pro, the as the project goes forward to do Correct. that. It, actually, it's in the um, list of uh, criteria that that they'll have to meet under the uh, COL. Got it. Okay, thank you. And okay. I'll add on, I'll add on to that. So the the COL um, goes all the way through construction. Once a new lease is penned after 
concept plan approval is obtained, we'll do the new lease, then we'll take the remaining items on the COL that have timelines and incorporate those as performance parameters into the new lease. Um, one of those, as Joe says, is, is going to be requirements for funding. Um, bonding is another possible method to, which is actually in all of our standard leases um, for any project over, I think, $100,000, it says in our leases, um, our, our tenants um, may be required to provide surety bonding to make sure that the project occurs. So there's several avenues for funding that we could pursue and be, have, and be shown as acceptable methods for financing. Thank you. Red? My questions are for the applicant. Okay. Um, I just have a, a quick question for Eric. As far as a item number one, obtain financial letters of commitment and financial pre-approval for the project on or before December 31st, 2017. Um, how did you come up with that date? Yeah. I know your explanation was, hey, I want to be firm, but I want to be have some consideration. But and you're want... looking at the consent of the landowner document? Yes. Which item number? Uh, page 123 of 188. 123 of 188. Obtain uh, uh, financial letters of commitment and or financial pre-approval for the project on or before December 31st, 2017. Yeah, that number I came up with working with TLC as a reasonable time for let's say COL approval is obtained, how long they're going to need to for a bank to turn around the paperwork and, and get that. And, and four months, about four months is what they stated was a reasonable amount of time that not too far out, not too short um, for them to obtain further, as Joe says, further commitment from the banks or from their lenders. Any conversations with uh, the banks on that? Did I have conversations yeah. with banks? No, I did not contact okay. banks. For all right, those are, those are my questions. Um, with that, I'll open up for public comment. Sharice, I know you, you'll have uh, um, three minutes on this, and then there's some questions uh, following that. So, uh, Sharice, come on up. Hello, honorable council members and staff. Sharice Hansen, TLC family. Well, for over a year now, we have shown our continued intentions to develop 833 Embarcadero. We have, in a timely manner, responded to all requests and questions. We have proven ourselves to be the best applicant with the most viable and best use of space project. Our family wish is to build it, operate it, and maintain it for the life of the lease. Tonight's request by council, tonight's requests by council have been addressed thoroughly, researched using accurate projections and estimates. From the beginning, our goals were backed by our understanding that we will complete this project, if you so decide. We wouldn't be here if we had any doubts, and the extra time we have had has only solidified our base understanding that indeed we can. Our actions have demonstrated our resolve as we continue to research all aspects of this project. Some of our research has been on hotel amenities. As hotel guests ourselves, we are happily experiencing new and old ways that we would run and maintain our boutique hotel. Our age allows us to relate to our particular demographic. We are young enough that we are in touch with modern technological adv advancements and old enough to appreciate the comforts of historically proven hotel business features. We are very excited by our food court endeavor, Neptune's Court. We have been diligently researching similar venues in other regions of California. It is a growing trend that is proving to be a lucrative business model. We are reorganizing the internal layout for optimal use of space, designing innovative waves for both kitchen and dining areas. We have been conversing with our interested vendors, working on ways to have synergy amongst owners, com complementary menus, use of the common area, signage, POS systems, and customer flow. FYI, the interested parties, two of them are Giovanni's and Little Hut, those highly um, lucrative businesses Eric mentioned. Um, they know the Embarcadero and they know what works. Um, the court will fill in each niche for family <laughs> dining with multiple members trying to decide what type of food they want and our concept allows each to get what they desire. Our open courtyard design and amenities allow families to relax by the bay. We will make this place as we as a local family would frequent often and therefore all families like us will, that don't currently frequent the Embarcadero will visit as well. Um, 
financials, we have all always been a financially viable candidate. Um, though through the, the thorough vetting of our finances by staff, it's re it will result in our ability to secure a more competitive rate lender sooner than we anticipated. Our bank also backed Anderson in and is understand a, and understands the viability of a like, like property. We have also been very successful with our newest location on the Embarcadero. In its first year, it has aided in the ability to save over $166,000 since April. This Teresa, I'm going to have to ask you to close, and I know yep. that there's some questions for you. Should be, yeah. You'll be able to get some stuff out. This should demonstrate our ability to fill up our startup funds and be a successful new building once built, especially with retail. All right. Thank, thanks, Answer Therese. Questions. Okay. And with that, I don't have any more speaker slips, so I'll close public comment. And um, with that, I'll turn it over for council as far as questions. And I'll start it off for uh, John, kind of the same order, uh, for questions for the applicant, and then we'll go through. May I just in case there's questions for both? Or yep. Yeah. Sure. Yep. All right. Thanks. And uh, thanks for um, responding to my email that I sent yesterday. I know you were busy with kids and stuff. School started. so um, And I asked a lot of questions. So some of them will be repetitive because I want to vet them out here um, out loud. So uh, pardon my redundancy, if you will. I, I, I'm still not clear on the startup costs and how you plan to fund the operation. Um, in your email response to me when I asked about it, um, I think you mentioned that your three companies that you have right now will allow you to more or less finance the project or at least the startup portion. Um, I don't know if that means the, the total project, uh, if, if the costs are somewhere around $3 million, or or could you just again elaborate um, based upon what we heard from the staff report, um, the sources of funding there, um, the email response, maybe we could just hear it directly from you. You guys, how do you plan on funding the operation um, at a macro level? Um, as was mentioned, you know the number up there is 600, 650 thousand. It may vary a little here or there, but uh, essentially, uh, in there is the soft cost architecture. Um, uh, excuse me. Uh, Engineering so, thing. So Travis, I'm just going to interject. Travis League for the record. So Travis part of this, yeah. Th yes. Sorry, sorry about that. But th um, yeah, and then in part with that startup money is the the amount sort of to bring to the bank as skin in the game, as they call it, in order to uh, facilitate putting the loan together. Um, we've discussed it at length with a couple institutions in town, and it may be like an amalgamation of a um, cost to build. I'm sorry. Um, what is it? Cost to loan to cost or um, um, cost to operate, I believe it was, and how they determined to, to loan us the money based on that. So, um, God, I'm nervous. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so therefore, part of that money of the 650000 is to go basically as part of the fund to get the financing through, through the bank. You're talking about loan to value? Mm -hmm. is that, okay. Yeah. Uh, loan to cost and loan to value. Thank you. Okay. So... so um if the project is a $3 million project, I mean, I'm just going to ask you, I have to ask you directly, uh, how much skin is going to be your own personal cash? How much will come from Mr. X, Mr. Y? And then how much do you anticipate will come from bank A, B, or C, or what? Sure. Just trying um, to get, get a handle on that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, like I said in the very last part, is that since April, um, when we were starting to save for this, um, the soft costs and for this preliminary amount that we need before we get the loan, I have been saving and I opened the new store on the Embarcadero, which is working exceptionally well. Uh, and I've been able to save $166,000 to date. Um, my projection, in when I mentioned in the RFP, was that we were going to try and save $100,000 a year. Um, time has gone by since then, and every permit process that we need to take every extended month, I'll be able to save more, which means that from Daguerre and from um, Zimmerman, we would loan less. Uh, but they have also shown that if we needed all of the money today, it would be in our accounts and available to us. So what we're doing is just following through with the, the soft costs and paying what we need to pay until we get to the point where we need to borrow the $3 million in construction. And then at that point, we would evaluate how much we would need from either party, and they would 
um, provide it. We have financial um, documents ready to have a loan with them with um, payment strategies and interest and what collateral they would find acceptable um, to feel that they would want to make this investment. So, so thank you for that. So, um, so you'd have whatever skin in the game you might be able to save up until the time that you needed money. Then you have some so-called local lenders that are private money lenders that are willing to go up to the limits that I think Eric outlined in the staff report and then the bank loan for the remainder of it. Could you tell me how you got to a debt service of twenty thousand dollars? Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Sorry. Oh, yeah. based Annually. on a twenty. Yeah, through what we anticipate borrowing from the bank, I believe the numbers are two seven two nine somewhere in that range. I did the numbers, I believe, on two point nine million um, at currently five percent on a twenty five year term. Came out to around seventeen thousand a month. Do the math, and that gives us a little buffer. Yeah. Um, so I got the same thing. What about the payback for the individuals that you're borrowing money from? That one comes from um, my current position with Great American Fish Company. We anticipate using um, my interest in there to the money basically that I make there would be utilized to pay back um, and as an exit strategy for the monies that we borrow um, from other lenders or private money. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so, so on your pro forma, that explains the difference between the 200000 I did the same thing, sure, and I got, got sure. what you got. The buffer that we have there. The, the remainder, which would be the other individuals right. that would be lending you money, right. would also end up as an expense item on your, your um, obviously, your performa or your income statement each month. But you're saying that comes from your own individual Correct. dollars or jobs that you Correct. have now. We anticipate paying them back with an exit strategy that comes from our own funds, therefore not adding to the debt service. The okay. Pool. Got it. Yeah. And sorry to be so detailed. Just it's trying fine. to vet out the viability financially of, sure. of being successful for a huge project like this. Sure. Um, and and I, I did notice I, I don't want to um, be inappropriate in asking you this or, or embarrass you, but it's important to me because um, I know when you were here last time, <clears throat> I asked about a marketing plan, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and um, a business plan, and then um, during the process with Eric, nothing came forward, and then today, I asked about it again yesterday, and I got kind of a shoestring business plan. Um, so I, I guess I'm just going to directly ask, you know, how, how are you going to manage uh, this kind of operation? What's your marketing plan? Because it's not really well detailed in, in this quick job that you did here, and Again, I apologize for that, but it did seem to be a rather uh, a cursory attempt at, at putting together a good business plan. So maybe you could help me understand how, how you're going to manage um, an entity like this and, and how you're going to market it so that I have a good understanding that you're going to be a, a viable operator. Okay. Well, um, it's a work in progress. It's something that we've been stating that uh, we enjoy education, learning new things. We are going to definitely take some marketing classes. This, uh, As far as the retail aspect of it, I have 18 years of experience. It's kind of, I just know what to do. And But with a hotel and a marketing plan like that, we will seek outside um, assistance via conferences and classes. Mm -hmm. and There's multiple avenues out there for us to become better hoteliers. And we are talking about, a, you know, not to downplay it, but we are talking about a seven-unit, you know, boutique hotel. Um, forgive me for saying it's not rocket science. Granted, I don't, it doesn't necessarily mean I don't anticipate some pitfalls along the way. But um, we believe that it's something that we definitely can handle. We've proven that we're good business people. So, um, and we do have a lot of um, sure, experience. individuals behind us that have offered their expertise. And um, Doug Redican, who has been in the hotel business for years, I talked to him today and he said that I should mention that you can call him if you want because he is actually very eager um, for us to be part of this project because we want to work together in managing and dealing with parking and um, customer relations and marketing as well. Again, not, I'm sorry to get um, detailed mm -hmm. on you, but you know it's important in terms of vetting the overall pro forma. You know, I, I didn't see an allowance for depreciation and amortization, which you know is really funding for the future. If I add back um, an assumed depreciation on three million in amortization costs for that um, to be able to fund the future, 
Um, I, I get kind of an upside down performa. Can you comment on that or tell me your thoughts about that? And, and Depreciation on the building over the 40 years, 50 years, depending on the, <clears throat> the lease term, and you get an upside down performa with that? Actually, I use 30 years with amortization and depreciation, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and startup costs. I should also say startup sure. costs. I didn't see an allowance for startup costs. Honestly, to be on the spot, we'll have to take a look at that and, yeah. and determine where you're coming up with those numbers. But sure. um, we basically see positive growth um, year to year and with the ability to put money aside for the building uh, depreciation as well. More or less, on terms of the other entities that you operate and what um, you do now, I'm, I'm yes. just yeah, just trying to Partially, understand it. Yeah, there is um, <laughs> quite a bit of revenue to be uh, taken in from the retail and the hotel as well, um, put back in. Um, as you'd mentioned, it is an expense um, to help service the debt. Exactly, uh, we will be charging ourselves rent um, to help pay that debt service, right. which is, I believe, a smart business choice. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think we've we've looked into. The majority of the details financially and again if you're having a problem with that maybe we need to look into it a little further as far as uh, the depreciation but I um, think, um, <clears throat> it's not necessarily a problem it's just sure. a, um, you know as a representative for the city wanting to get it's not you or anybody no. else whoever came up here you know I'd want to see a good solid business plan a good solid marketing plan and a good solid pro forma uh, based upon something that included all expenses for the project gotcha. and, and that was absent so that I have to ask about it. Um, again, nothing personal sure. whatsoever. Um, my, I guess my last question um, for you would be, um, in, in terms of um, the time that you have had since you were here last time and now, um, do you feel that, that, that you have, um, I guess, come a long way in terms of your understanding of the concept? And I think, Trevs, you, you mentioned that it's, it's almost like a, it's my word, no-brainer, but it's not rocket science, I think were your term, in terms of running a hotel, but I see it as a very different um, business entity than maybe what you're currently doing. Sure. Um, what, what have you done in the interim period to, I guess, better understand that, that business that, and the market and, and those kinds of things to be successful? Specifically, the business running a boutique hotel, just uh, educated myself as much as possible, done a lot of reading, um, looked into the courses that her and I have to, uh, talked about, um, different ones out there to take online or actual um, degree courses uh, in hotel management, et cetera. So. Uh, um, a large percentage of the time we've been spending on actual amenities and understanding what is best for the customer um, in the construction aspect of it. We want to know um, as far as like keyless entries, we've been researching um, those type of um, applications and um, mostly really trying to work on the, the internal structure of the building portion of it. Uh, currently that's what we're spending the majority of our time on as far as marketing as you see with the col um, we will have three years to fine-tune our marketing and really meet with everybody but for right now in this particular stage of the game and the concept phase we're really working on the actual construction and the ingredients inside and making sure that they're going to withstand the years to come Hey, thanks for allowing me to uh, get through all my questions. I appreciate you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Marlos? Sure. Well, I'll, I'll uh, start out by asking you to give me some more details about the food court and okay. how many vendors will be there and exactly where will people sit and, and how will that work? Okay. So the internal structure right now, um, we have uh, three kind of longer um, areas where the kitchens would be and so they have like a front area it would most likely be um, like a sneeze guard kind yeah. of <laughs> setting um, one of the really uh, prominent features that we're seeing in a lot of the current restaurants is that it's you have an item and you kind of make it yourself there's blaze pizza in San Luis Obispo there um, and the ingredients are all there so everybody can have it their own way um, uh, the poke bowl um, poke items poke rito um, we're going to try and tailor make it for that type of venue and we're working with the interested parties to see how each one would want their setup to be um, but it would be a walk-in 
look at it, pick it out, and uh, it wouldn't in pay. Um, so it would be fast in the extent that um, you would get it right when you walk up and you could walk out to your tables. Um, so there would be the two, uh, three kiosks of kitchens going in that, in, if you looked at the blueprints. And then we would have one area that would be an inside outside bar. So when the net weather was nice, they could actually use one of those roll up windows so they can have a bar, existing bar outside as well. Um, and then all would have access to a soda machine, um, like the ones that they have at the movie theaters now. Anyway, there's all those little aspects that we're working on to make sure that they all get to have the amenities that they need as a functioning restaurant, but then um, a nice kitchen where they are able to have all of their fixtures that are necessary for every food type of business. Um, as far as seating, is concerned. Um, it's on the blueprints, uh, the exact area that we have. Um, we're still going to wor work with each um, person, uh, owner, to, to design the seating arrangements. But as right now, the square footage is a very sizable amount that can accommodate this kind of venue. And then outside seating as well. Um, we're going to have a good square footage outside of seating. And if it's really nice weather, um, the windows will open and expand to just have a, a bigger open air feeling. Um, and then we will also have the play area, which will have um, crest and trough type seating. of seating, seating that's around the um, play area that will accommodate people viewing the kids or just enjoying the weather or eating their food. So there's going to be tons of seating. Uh, and is there also the whole property? So and to your first question, three three restaurants, one bar, so four uh, different operators, and then one yogurt shop. Yeah, which is separated outside. and outside, closer right. to the play okay. area. That's four separate. And is there any indoor seating? Yes. Oh yes, yes. If you look at the the uh, original plan that you guys had from the last meeting, shows okay, fourteen hundred and something feet, I believe, of, of seating. indoor seating. Yes. Right. And then, as she mentioned, um, I've got designed a couple rolling walls, hopefully to put in one that goes to the bar and then one that opens to the front bay, bay side there. Um, and then we really just want to have the whole property open for, for whatever. I mean, we want people to mingle and be able to eat outside, inside, wherever. And um, like she had mentioned earlier in her comments, we're working with, with the different potential people going in there on, on flow, traffic flow, how we're going to, you know, get it to, to, to work properly. So um, creating a synergy. Uh, and I, just to follow up a little bit on John's question about management, um, since you don't have hotel management experience, but you do have retail, and now you're talking about really a much larger, you're still going to have the retail, correct? And you would still be managing that, and you're also planning on managing the hotel? And what in the restaurants are sublet, is that... Right. Um, Travis will be the lead on the hotel. We will have a um, hired uh, manager that has hotel experience to what degree. That's in That's two and a half to three years um, okay. to find them. We can't secure that right now, although I would like to. And actually, Doug has some candidates already for me to look at. Uh, we put forty grand, I believe, in under administrative for that type of a feature if we need to bring in outside right. from a management standpoint. And it's, it states thirty eight thousand and that's not our part. It right. ours is the profit portion. Right. Okay. We will not be paying ourselves. Uh, so you are gonna bring in some experience. If necessary, between again, we've got three years to determine if, if necessary to bring in a hotel management. Um, outsider. Okay. But, uh, and then uh, what are you going to do about your uh, business during uh, construction? Hers? Um, yes. I, I currently have four businesses. <laughs> uh, one's in Hawaii. I'm not there, and it's doing great. So I have the Hawaii. I have Avila. Avila. That's my manager, Mimi, back there. And so I go there for about four hours a week. Um, once I establish uh, what it is that I want in the businesses, I'm able to let it run itself and, uh, and do well on its own. I, I know ways of micromanaging, and then I also know ways of organizing and setting 
plans out for my um, employees that I work with um, to follow without so, me having to be in there 24-7. Was that your question or was your concern about the revenue she would be losing oh, during the It was time? both. It was okay. both. Yeah. Um, oh. And again, she... Revenue I would lose? Well, can you guys the put the microphone down, somewhere in the or, middle? So, um, uh, can you put the microphone somewhere in the I middle? I know I, we get all the time Sorry. folks saying, hey, we can't hear <laughs> um, it, folks, and so I'm just trying to help. Thanks. I know. Um, I, I, I know, yeah, thanks. So, yeah, so while the, the downtime during construction phase, she would obviously be losing um, one of her you know, smaller retail units currently existing, but um, um, as she mentioned, she does well with the three existing that would still be operational. Okay. And you've obviously worked with Eric on the milestones, so you're comfortable with the milestones? You believe you can meet sure. those and they're reasonable? Yes, I believe that the milestones are reasonable, but if we take a year and a month to complete the right. construction, does that mean you guys get it at that point? Right. We get all the way to the end, and it took one year and one month. No, she's just kidding. Um, um, yeah, no, I don't have a problem with those No, milestones. not at all. It's actually a very fair, uh, reasonable timeline. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, sure. I, I just had a few questions um, for you um, about construction, uh, Travis, because mm -hmm. um, a lot of the questions have already been asked and you were answered. I think in the plans you submitted um, this last time, you talked about various um, parts of the st uh, structure that you would be putting in solar or more... Uh, um, um, energy efficient uh, amenities in terms of making this a not a new age piece of construction but trying to use that in part of your marketing could you explain what you would be doing um, yes we we really want to create a property that um, sort of sets a standard for what modern development should be we would like to put in some solar we would like to put in some um, gray water gray water retention systems um, some what are known as um, inductive load um, for like the the refrigeration and things like that there's um oh god why is it evading me right now but essentially a, a, a way to reduce the amount of, of um, energy used on those large inductive loads um we want to put some historical aspects to the building as well uh, in and around the property for people to educate themselves so essentially we're trying to build a property that once people are on it they're going to want to stay for a while and and um, enjoy the property as a whole um, we do have some unique design ideas to put in some, some aesthetics that will ultimately draw people in off the street to um, take some photographs. Um, what else? What am I missing right now as far as ideas for the solar. property? Oh, the solar I discussed. Yeah, we, we're going to definitely put solar on the roof as well. And Sharice, here, here's a question for you. I think you had mentioned um, in the last couple times you've spoken um, in front of this um, in front of us, you talked about working with other hoteliers in the area, and not necessarily, um, but how would you be doing that, and how would that benefit you and then benefit the Embarcadero? Okay. Um, myself, as a person, I really like working, working with my neighbors. Um, I feel that um, Bert's project, um, once we have a COL in place, I, I would like to commence um, speaking with him again about um, you know, a nice relationship between us and our buildings and having it um, work out really well for all of us, Doug and Bert and ourselves. Um, I believe that in that area, uh, we can probably have a really um, good relationship with each other that helps all of us do well, um, figuring out uh, certain issues such as parking um, and then also marketing. It, uh, they also bring to the table knowledge from past experiences that we could learn from and then we would be more of a, of a, of a gathered entity online presence wise. Um, there's other people who have offered um, advice. Um, Aaron Graves mm -hmm. on the Discuss preliminary, and uh, I have a lot of other people, Anderson, and and we have resources that we've reached out to to discuss operations of, of the hotel. So, um, you know, we again, the people have been willing to lend us their information on how to get it done and and have been really receptive to us calling and asking you know hey how's this work you know explain to us a little bit how the hotel works down here so um, uh, there's other people such as um, Tiffany Berry who is a close mm -hmm. friend previous roommate who successfully runs a, a 
a 22 room hotel in Puerto Rico and they don't live there and they're very successful um, she's offered her assistance as well um, besides the fact that we're definitely going to be looking into all the different online um, abilities and courses that we can take to further educate ourselves thank you Andre. Red I have a couple of questions about the Centennial Parkway um, <clears throat> On your proposal, you say that you wish to have the council acknowledge that in our development, we would have to remove some of our current design features to make funds available for any financial contributions to the Centennial Parkway. It, what does that mean? Okay, so as far as what we have funds available once we start construction, we have balanced our budget to understand that how much we can loan and how much we, um, we can use on the borrow. property, borrow. And so that number within the next five years isn't going to change based on permits and needs and then the startup costs as well as, you know, just the first few years, it's... it's you want to have cushions in your finances. So knowing that we have this amount that we're able to spend, we have all of these other um, benefits, public benefits. We have the reverse periscope. We have the playground. We have the benches and the seating around the play area. We want to extend the boardwalk out five more feet, and we're looking at the financial viability of that, which I think would be an incredible asset to everyone because I feel that the walkway at 10 feet, kind of eight feet is like walking. And then if you're standing at the, at, at the, it's tight. It, yeah, it's, you, you just don't feel like you can hang out. But if we did five more feet, I would like to spend my public benefit money on that. Uh, and then, so I'm going to spend all the money on that property as we, as we are provided to be a success and to continue once we have completed the project to be able to pay our bills and continue for years to come. Uh, but it is going to take away from any of those attributes that we've already built into our budget if we're going to um, um, separate an, an expense at the same time for the Centennial Parkway. Um, one of the things that we were talking about is that we could do something um, now that kind of aids in, in the Centennial Parkway. Parkway project um, in, in between the Libertine and uh, Roses. Um, me, myself, having the under the sea gallery at 725, my view is the parking lot. And I see so many possibilities there. I've tried to talk to, uh, well, I have talked to uh, friends of the harbor and to doing evening events and uh, screen movies at night and turning it into kind of just a grassy knoll where people bring their own chairs and they hang out there I just think it's it's not a good use of space and it's something can, that can actually happen sooner than later I know with the Centennial Parkway all the things that you have to go back and forth in order to get the project approved could we just do something with that area now um, so that's one of the things that I was talking about because we will have um, some funds and if Travis as a contractor we would save money and therefore be able to put more money into our um, our Centennial Parkway. So um, basically benefit. what she's saying is that, you know, we've allocated a certain amount of money in the construction project towards the public benefit of our property and um, depending on the amount that we're, um, ne is necessary to contribute to Centennial Parkway, it may detract from some of the public benefit on our own property. And it's also a time um, if you are going to desire the money in five years, maybe that could be built into it. If you have to have a number that we contribute by this said date that doesn't um, restrict us in any way from completing our project, that could be a possible um, benefit. But then the other thing that I, I have said from the beginning is maintenance. A lot of the things that aren't thought about during this Centennial Parkway is the actual upkeep of it for years to come. And I have offered our ability to maintain any of the features in Centennial Parkway, chess, stage, stage um, and those kind of items. And then if there's anything in the Centennial Parkway about parking, that would be directly correlated with something that we need for our building. So we would be um, definitely inclined to help with that. 
and as was stated, we're interested in offering a level of commitment to the Centennial Parkway. We want to see it to fruition. It's just difficult to determine what that is going to be at this point, um, but we are definitely interested in seeing it through. Okay, uh, but what I'm hearing is that you don't have any funds to contribute to Centennial Parkway without reducing the scope of, of your other project? Mm, not necessarily. Um, we will build it into um, our, our loan right. for our debt because if something is going to happen with Centennial Parkway at the same time that we are going to be constructing the project, that will be the available funds that we will be able to do. And that means maybe the public benefit that we want to put in now will happen later. Or the Centennial Parkway contribution that you want will happen later. But if it happens at the same time as when we're doing construction, we will be maxed out on what we are able to um, put forth. Right. Okay. Um, so I guess that what I'm looking for then is a commitment that you do want to participate in Centennial Parkway um, and it would be up to the city to negotiate terms that would work for both entities. Correct. Okay. That's all. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks you guys hanging there. Um, I'm just going to talk about some of the financial part of things, um, specifically on the development cost and the, the lending part. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at the staff report here, so I'm going off this. Um, basically, so 3.2 to 3.5 million um, estimated costs, um, and with the intent of borrowing 2.7 million on that. So um, what kind of conversations with the bank have you had on that type of loan um, considering um, the percentage of um, um, investment um, uh, to, to the loan? Well, 70% loan to value is the number we discussed. Um, so bringing in capital to make up that. Um, the unique part is, of this... Is that what the bank has, yes. has talked about? Okay. Yes. Yes, and uh, unique to this is me being the contractor, there is sort of, I don't know how to describe it, but um, available funds there that can be considered sort of credit. You know, we discussed this. Um, I will be 10% contractor fee on the project as well. So that can, in some level, serve as some of the skin in the game necessary to be brought to, um, to the table. Um, as well as the capital that we have to, to put in as well. So we've got to bring a certain amount of cash to yeah. put in to a contingency to um, interest reserve, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that's where these numbers are coming yeah, from. Yeah, and so the cash that we're looking at, sorry, these are th these are kind of detailed questions as well. But sure. So um, there's I'm looking at the what's in the staff report. So 150000 is what you've got in, in the bank. There's six, 650000 that's banked for the development of the project. And where is that from? Okay. You want to... <laughs> we... Okay. So we currently... I have in our bank 166000 And as we go through the permit process, I will still be saving money. So let's say that in a year and a half we're ready to do construction. We would have hopefully saved in my projections um, 300000 So 300000 of the 650000 And it's really between 500 and, and 600 is is our target. Um, for the bank's sure. opinion, and anything over and above that three hundred thousand that we will have saved by the time that the loan um, originates will be um, provided by my father, Charles Zimmerman, um, who we've been in talk with. He's actually watching. Anything we and, need over and above the right at at a reasonable rate with reasonable timelines and reasonable um, payback. Uh, procedures, um, and then after that, uh, Gio Giovanni. Um, he has the ability to kind of make Great America, our investment in Great American Fish Company, liquid at the time, and so we would more or less be paying back to keep our investment in Great American Fish Company. Hopefully, that wasn't confusing. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, those are all the questions I have. I, did that make sense? In other words, the money's coming from what we can save, and then 
part of the money that we need to bring to the bank, um, okay. you know, would be based yeah. on my position in the restaurant, um, you know, any other funds that okay. we need to secure. Okay. So when you say your position in the restaurant, it's not um, a, a stake in the restaurant, but it's... An but investment. Uh, is that right? Yes. But no. It's, uh, yeah. So, uh, so I guess, so literally... Um, as collateral. Uh, so you'd have, you'd be giving up collateral of Correct. the restaurant. Correct. Okay. I have some questions about that from, yeah. Okay. All right. Th that, that, uh, sure. that answers everything. All right. Thanks. Any other further questions? Okay. Thank you. And, um, I just have a follow-up question, um, Joe on, um, that I mean, I you know, I, I suppose I could stay up there. But so when we we have another lease site, so do we when we go into collateral with another lease site like that, what what's the procedure for for that? If we're holding collateral of another lease site investment, and and that is that what did I did I understand I, I didn't, that? I didn't understand that. Okay. That's what was being okay. said, suggested. What I understood was he has a monetary um, share of that restaurant. Okay. And it's his personal monetary share that would okay. be collateral to support. Sorry, okay, Travis, that, you're shaking. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, good. Um, okay, all right, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so um, I'm going to keep going in the same order. John, you want to start us off on discussion? Thank you guys for letting us grill you, no pun intended, on that. Um, but, but obviously... Um, uh, personally, I, I take the responsibility um, as the city councilman, uh, you know, obviously very seriously be, because um, we're here to maximize the return on investment for the city, um, especially with the lease site like this, which is very desirable, um, in order to fund a future that right now is looking somewhat bleak for, for the city. And, and, and the economics... Um, um, become um, of prime import to the city. It's our most, uh, it's our number one goal in the city with regard to um, improving our financial viability in the future because of some of the, the future hits that we're going to continue to take. And so, so I know we spend a lot of time on trying to vet and understand, you know, the finances. And, and I, I appreciate um, all of your, your uh, businesses that you've been involved in and and um, that you're currently involved in and the excellent work that you do and your reputation in the city is outstanding. Um, I think we all know that. Um, I, I'm going to summarize my concerns and, and, and tell you where I more or less have landed. Um, my concerns are, um, um, first, um, financial viability. I, I get the potential sources of funds um, that you've mentioned. Um, and, and I understand um, liquefying um, certain um, investments now that are good investments and then, you know, turning that into liquid cash as part of, um, you know, the skin in the game, so to speak, for a project like this. But if the LTV is, you know, you know um, somewhere around 70%, then that means you come up with 30%. That's a, that's a hefty number. Um, and And... My biggest concern is I wonder if we have deep enough pockets with you as a as a um, as a lessee, a potential lessee, to be able to to manage this and see it uh, through to fruition. When I hear comments again, I just I wrote these down verbatim um, regarding. Um, you know, the operation and running the operation like it's not rocket science, which means, you know, you, you have expertise. And, and uh, personally, I've vetted a hotel before. I don't have that expertise. I, I, I looked at one uh, for purchase, and, and I brought in experts to, to really um, vet it completely for me before I even would think about um, going into the business. And, and, and that hasn't happened, although you've talked to, I think, a number of individuals and I commend you for that, that are running successful operations, you know, on the Embarcadero. Um, and then when I hear uh, comments about um, we're going to take marketing classes and, and, and Shree says, well, I just know what to do. And I get that. You're working in retail. You've got successful businesses. And, and I think you think that, that this one is going to be successful because of what you've done in the past. And, 
and, and then I, I, I worry about the ability to contribute to Centennial Parkway um, because the city, in order to realize um, projects like that that will significantly contribute to the economy of the city in the future, have got to be shared with developers of projects along the Embarcadero in that area. And, and that, again, um, speaks to having deep enough pockets then to be a, a player in that. And, and when you were questioned about that, I'm still not clear, you know, how that that participation will manifest itself. And I know there's no exact number. Uh, we haven't said, you know, you could contribute this much money, but but I do know it's going to take um, some fairly significant resources and in, in the ability to commit to resources in the future um, that I would be looking for in a lessee for that site. My second. Um, um, the concern is just the the financial performance metrics that I saw in the staff report. Um, um, I, I, I'm concerned that um, the the way the numbers are expressed, um, that uh, the the cash production as I see it, um, without depreciation and amortization, and, and then paying rent to yourself, and some of the other things that I brought up. Um, I think make it viable, but but I don't know that it, it, it looks as viable as it potentially could be um, if it were operated with the expertise that um, somebody that's done this kind of hotel business before would bring. Um, and and I, I did do some comparative analysis um, with um, a hotel broker, um, trying to get an understanding of what something like this should produce. And and the numbers are, are quite a bit higher than, than what I see in terms of bottom line, uh, you know, that has come from the entity itself. And so I, I get concerned about that. I, um, I also, you know, asked last time about the business plan and marketing plan, and I know often it's just a piece of paper. Um, and I do understand that it may seem like just a paperwork exercise, but you know when you go to the bank, one of the things they're going to ask for right up front is a marketing plan and, and your business plan and a financial pro forma. And um, I almost wish that you hadn't sent this today because it's really um, j just a quick paperwork exercise. It's, it's not, a, in my opinion, a good business plan. It's not a viable business plan. But it looked like it was just to satisfy the answer to my question of having a business plan. And again, please, I don't mean to push you down. That's not my extent at all. But I'd rather not have this type of um, this type of work um, as opposed to saying, "Hey, you know, we'll work on a business plan," and, and that's something that we need to do because this is just a skeleton of one. In my opinion, again, it is my opinion. So, so for all those reasons, and the reason that I talked about last time, I think may be the paramount reason um, that I'm concerned is that you know with the Centennial Parkway project, I think this lease site lends itself to doing something on a grander scale um, with um, um, a, a deeper pocket entity that could benefit the city um, to a greater extent. And I'm all about, you know, um, um, supporting folks that are local and and perpetuating models that have worked in the past. But, but again, uh, I think for uh, something like this, if we're going to become financially viable in the future, I I am called and, and responsible for really trying to do the best that I can for the city in terms of um, um, getting the right party in there to really maximize the return on investment to the city long term. And, and for that reason, I'm leaning towards actually going back out to RFP um, on this, this site itself. And um, I say that with all due respect and with all concern for the amount of time that you've put in. I value that. Um, again, I think you are wonderful, great people, and I know my saying that does not make you feel um, um, very comfortable, but that is my opinion as an elected official for this city. So I'll stop there and listen to other comments. Thanks, John. Marlis? Uh, yeah, I, I share uh, many of John's concerns, and I think I expressed them at our first meeting uh, uh, when this came up. 
Um, I am concerned, especially, I think, about the lack of hotel management experience and the ability to manage a project of this size and scope. Uh, I, I think we need that there. And, you know, to move forward, I think I would need to see that as a condition almost of, of moving forward. Um, I realize that, you know, the applicants have done a lot of work on this, and I know they're dedicated, and I know they want it, it to succeed. And, you know, at the time, we did not have any other application for this. I mean, the, we only had two, and this was clearly the better of the two. Um, I don't know that I am ready to say we should go back out uh, for RFP, but I would definitely like to see some conditions placed so that in addition to these milestones, we get some of the business plan, the marketing plan, the documents that I know John hoped to see at this point. Um, we have, the applicants have until December 31st to get financing, so it's going to be incumbent upon them to actually produce some of these documents to get financing. So I'm willing to move towards that milestone and 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 then see what happens. Okay, Marlis, thanks. Matt? In terms of this prog um, process, in terms of um, this lease coming up as it's coming, um, as it's been brought to us the last few years, we've had two bodies come and present their case to us. Um, and um, this group, I thought, presented the best uh, plan. They did. Um, in terms of um, financing, um, they've shown, are they completely liquid back that they can cover every um, entity? No. But however, um, I feel um, secure that they have shown that they have sufficient um, funds to go through this process. Um, right now, my question to Eric during questions was, for the COL, does this money cover it and can they do it? Can, have they demonstrated that they can? Yes, they have. Um, sh have they done the hotel part of it? No. But however, in terms of their businesses and retail and restaurant, with their enthusiasm, with the other um, businesses down there in that collective, as they say, synergy, um, not necessarily promoting them, but however, it's like, I do believe, especially in terms of the various bodies that came, the other en entity that brought their plan also, um, TLC, I thought demonstrated and is still demonstrating. John, I totally agree with you in terms of the business plan. Okay, it could... Um, you know, I'm not an expert at all in terms of business plans. You um, no doubt know more than I do. And so, okay, um, I can see that perhaps lacking. But however, in, the, in everything else that we've asked them in terms of Eric, it seems listening to Eric talk about um, negotiating with them, they've answered um, completely and 100% over the top. Perhaps not. I mean, these folks are, they're just, they're coming up also, and they're, they want to make it work. Um, so I guess in terms of my discussion, I'm, um, I feel um, very confident in terms of um, us being covered as a city, in terms of what was there before, um, in terms of their backing, they've demonstrated it. Um, certainly with Eric, I think Eric in terms of the planning has shown that we have sufficient safeguards to protect us as a city, but then also promote that part of the, um, of the Embarcadero and especially looking ahead in terms of the other, from Roses to the Libertine, to the Boyard, et cetera, et cetera, I do believe that this development would fit very nicely there. That's, me, that's it. Thanks. Matt, uh, Red? I share John's concerns about the financial viability and about looking ahead to hotel management. Um, I agree with John that the what we received tonight in the way of a marketing plan and a business plan are not plans. Um, and I am concerned. Um, I do appreciate your enthusiasm and your proven ability to run businesses. Um, but I'm just concerned about the, the depth of the financial commitments that you have. Um, and I also agree with Matt that I would like to give you an opportunity to prove this project, but I don't feel as if I have enough 
at this time to make a full commitment. Um, you have until December 31st, according to the conditional COL, to obtain of uh, your financial commitments. I would like to add another condition that you present a professional business plan and a professional marketing plan to include education in hotel management or, or a consultant. And I would also like to see something concrete in the way of contribution to the Centennial Parkway. Um, I'm not comfortable with the idea that if you contribute money to Centennial Parkway, you have to take away money from your project. That's, that's not a business plan at all. So um, I would like to see the conditions in the COL modified to include the marketing and business plan and Centennial Parkway. Is that it? Okay. All right. Thanks for everybody's comments. And uh, I uh, voiced a little bit of my a um, apprehension at the the last meeting, and um, I'm I'm just going to get right to it. I, I I'm in support of going out for RFP. Unfortunately, um, having revisited this, um, I, you know, I'm looking at uh, for one thing, we're looking at. Um, um, December 31st is the time to get out, to get this COL. That's what's been presented to us um, uh, with um, uh, input from TLC, which I appreciate. But um, having done a little bit of research on this, I, I am definitely concerned we're going to get to that, and we're how are, if we're guaranteed we'll be. Or if we're, we have confidence that we'll we'll meet that, and, and I, I looked at that initially, and, and which is one of my questions about why December thirty first, uh, why not sixty days? You know, why not thirty days? Why not six days? Why why not something more um, expeditious? And of course, you know, I know I understand it takes time to do that, but I understand that um, those that are um, a little bit more backed will be able to get through this a little bit quicker, and so. Um, don't pretend to be an expert on this, but I um, I, I feel as though we've um, put forth an effort as a, a city to to vet um, uh, what kind of projects we might get for this, and I don't have a, a sense of confidence with the amount of um, financial interests that um, the applicants have for this project, and there's actually quite a bit of extended investors to make it whole, which, you know, I, I still kind of question whether or not um, there will be the pre-approval. So, th though I, I um, will, am interested in, in uh, Marlos's comments and, you know, going to December 31st, uh, you know, I, I appreciate those comments. Um, I've kind of rethought things, and um, I I'm kind of in line with John uh, as far as just going out to RFP um, and understanding that there's five of us that will have to come to decision on this. But those are those are my feelings. I I, I feel as though um, it's um, it's been a long process. And I appreciate the work, but um, at this point, I, I just don't have the confidence. So for me, um, yeah, I would support going out for RFP, and you know, I understand. Um, the discussion that's been had from everybody. So that's that's where I'm at. And so it's going to take some other discussion to actually put a motion forward on what direction we want. And um, I'll open it up for some more discussion. Matt? Yes. Um, as I see it, um, Red, I like your suggestions in terms of the marketing plan, business plan. And I think Centennial Parkway, um, how did you um, word that? A concrete contribution. A concrete contribution, and I think you also wanted um, a, a secure funding um, list. Is that? Did you mention that also? Yeah. Well, the what is already in the uh, the proposed COL, the item number one. Got it. Okay. And then Marlis, in terms of um, your December thirty first. Um, 
I mean, I could see the December 31st, but however, Jamie had a very good point in terms of, you know, what's the arbitrary date? Could we, instead of, because that's what, that's four months, do we call it 60 days? 60 days should be enough for someone to put these things together. Um, and, I mean, although I understand in terms of RFP, John and Jamie saying it out to that, um, putting it out to that, um, however, with these, I mean, Red, I thought, um, really listed some very concrete things that can be done in a period of time. And given the work that this group has done, considering the history of this project coming from where it's come in the last few years, um, so I would, um, I would not be in favor of going out to RFP, um, but I would be in favor of uh, doing what Red's conditions are and then also maybe amending a, a shorter time frame, maybe 60 days. Any further discussion? Uh, I, maybe I could ask for clarification on exactly what, what you mean, um, Councilman Makowetsky. I'm not sure I understand. Um, you can clarify for me um, what, what your intent is that would be helpful. So right now, um, as far as I understand it, the, um, this group has until December 31st to satisfy um, the uh, expectations of this COL. And right now, we are have, uh, except for me, we have folks up here who are not um, sure or secure that this, pro that this project will go forward because of um, missing things within the pro um, project. Um, Councilman Davis mentioned that he would say, for to see this project go forward, he'd want to see a more secure marketing plan, a more secure business plan. Um, and then a, a, a commitment to a, a, a concrete commitment to Centennial Parking, Cent Centennial Parkway. So, with those three um, expectations, mean that we'd want them to be satisfied. Instead of waiting till December 31st, we'd want those three things satisfied to the satisfaction of this group um, by in 60 days. But the COL hasn't been granted yet. That's what we're we're looking. No, no, I understand that. But in terms of we would be offering that COL and conditional con to yes. granting. Yes. Is that what you're talking yes. about? Yes. Okay. Uh, that that's a little easier to understand. Got it. Okay. Okay. Sorry. That's mm -hmm. what I was missing. Okay. So, could I get a legal clarification on how we could proceed with a, a conditional use permit if we put conditions like that on? What I understood to be suggested is before the, the council makes a final decision on whether or not to issue the COL, approve the COL, there's three things that you want to see. You want to see a marketing plan, you want to see a business plan, you want to see a specific number, uh, dollar amount to be committed toward Centennial Parkway, and you want to have the some level of commitment um, on funding for the entire project. The reason I use that last language on that last thing I said is because whatever funding you get, whatever commitment they get is going to have a lot of contingencies. And those contingencies right now are going to be really a lot of contingencies. As the project goes forward and they get approvals for their um, plan, they get a lease, those contingencies are going to come down. So I, I don't want to leave you with the idea that the commitment you're going to see at this stage is not the commitment I think you're, some of you are thinking you want. It's too early in this, it doesn't matter who it is, unless someone comes in and has $10 million in their pocket, you're not going to see that kind of funding commitment. So if what, you, if what your intent is, is you want to see someone with $10 million in their pocket or something similar, then that's what you should, and you, and you want to ensure that then you should send it out on the RFP and have that one be one of the conditions of the RFP. What is it reasonable to expect at this stage of the game, then? At this stage, it's reasonable to, to, to be getting letters of interest, let, letters, letters of interest that say, if, if these things happen, then we're right behind you. That's the most you're going to get. And even you may not even get that at this point because there's still a lot of um, uncertainties, and so a bank, as you know, is going to be very conservative, isn't, isn't going to want someone to be able to say, but you promised that you would give it to me if X, Y, and Z was uh, met. So the X, Y, Zs are going to be pretty qualitative. 
But the commitments from individuals who offered to uh, contribute or to invest in this project, that would be reasonable to get, correct? If somebody was willing if, to loan if, if, money. If, if they have some, if, if there's a person that they know that's willing to give them money based on nothing but their um, promise to them, that's a letter that you certainly could see. So, um, from a from a financial viability standpoint, uh, and I'm I'm speaking to my peers um, here, in terms of um, um, a greater greater um, comfort in understanding um, the financial viability of the applicants, if in 30 days you had letters of commitment with qualifications as outlined by legal counsel because there will be qualifications there won't be a full commitment no you're not going to get any commitment letter right now if you had promises from each individual that the applicant has mentioned and the terms associated that for um, the liquid um, cash that would be available to the applicants and if you had um, statements and an understanding of the individ individual's personal finances because I believe some of the um, um, financial contribution was predicated on a go forward um, profitability of existing businesses which you're not going to see in 30 days either I mean I, I don't understand how I get there and feel comfortable and I don't understand how I answer Mr. Davis's question about a solid commitment because I don't understand if they're not able to show that kind of financial viability now um, without showing viability for um, a contribution to Centennial Parkway, how I could reasonably grant a COL. I, I, don't, I don't know how we get there. I just don't, I don't see it. Uh, I just want to make one clarification, maybe some comments on that because, my, yeah, I, you know, I... I think the the key to get the letter of commitment is to have the COL in hand, right? And so we we need to have the uh, the council would have to approve this the COL, in which time in which time they could get their letter of commitment from the bank. Even if they go into the bank with their COL, it's still going to be a condition. It's mm -hmm. not going to be uh, absolutely ironclad commitment. They're not going to get that until they have their entitlements approved and their lease. Then they're going to get, and even then, it's going to have some qualifications, but it's typical qualifications. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Um, I, I, Let me just go ahead. That, that's assuming they're going to get um, commercial financing. If there's a rich uncle that promises to give them $10 million, then all those contingencies wouldn't be necessary. Okay, thanks. One thing I, I understand in terms of the COL, in terms of any sort of entity that's going to come and want to have this, uh, uh, attain this lease, they're going to have to go through this process. And as Eric was explaining in terms of the COL, the first stage of it, I think, Eric, you said it was going to, it was going to cost more or less $650,000 to get through that first stage? Uh, no, I didn't necessarily say it cost that. It's, that's the, the funding they have in place now to get going and start down that path. Okay. But in terms of that first phase, in terms of the phases of this construction, what sort of money do you anticipate them needing um, to I, get through the preliminary planning? I um, don't have that figure. Okay. That depends on their engineering and the design people and who they hire and, and you know their whole team of architects and engineers and others consultants to get through the planning and permitting process. Um, okay, no no problem, because be, the reason I say that, in terms of getting the COL, and as if the, in starting on this process, in terms of their planning, and then if they were able to um, satisfy, even if, if we give them a month, two months to um, satisfy these, even more, these next um, stages to get a COL, or even if we give them a COL tonight, However, they have X amount of time, and if they don't satisfy it, they're going to lose it. Um, so in terms of us being out um, as a city, yes, we will be out time that in, at the end of that year we could get that, this property back. The lease will be up. We'll put it out to um, RFP again. Um, 
However, we've been through this process, this vetting process with two entities, and we did uh, award this um, bid to this group. Um, and so I think that it is, um, with these additional conditions, I do believe that it, it could be a, uh, a valid uh, um, COL. Okay, unless there's any other um, um, discussion, I'm ready for a motion. Yep, uh, Red. I do want to get some clarification about the cash in hand. Is it six hundred and fifty thousand dollars that you have in the bank right now to help fund you to start, or was it a hundred and sixty-six thousand, and you anticipate get, adding to that from future business revenue? Okay, so currently of our own money, that would be our investment to date. It's 166, 166,000. Um, available funds from other parties um, are over $600,000. So if we took the full amount and we made Great American Fish Company's investment and uh, borrowed against it, and in, in we would be making that investment that we have in Great American Fish Company liquid, and that $500,000 would become available to us. So that would make it a, a bad number. And then my stepfather has offered $100,000 and put his letter of intent, and he's in um, constant conversation with me uh, about that amount, um, possibly uh, more if need be. So if we broke ground tomorrow and asked for a loan and we had the COL and all of the proper timelines um, were followed, the level of commitment um, for the banks, we would be um, over what our needed amount at that time is today. Um, and yes, they would, and we had the COL in hand. Um, they could therefore do the higher level of commitment that you guys are asking for right now. It, it's layered in, as Attorney Panon said, that as we breach each level, the, it gets less stringent on, and, and there's more level of commitment from the bank. We have, as we've demonstrated, the funds to get started. I do have numbers, preliminary numbers, on soft costs right now. Um, I can pull some of those out for you. I've been doing bids from different uh, contractors in the area, not to mention um, I, I pretty much know what my engineer is going to cost me, my architect, the remaining fees, uh, soils reports, things of that sort. Once we start, you know, basically at this point, we were looking for the COL in hand before we go start spending this next chunk of money that is a very, very large chunk of money we need to spend. That $166,000 is what we have set aside to initially spend right off the bat. And then also, um, uh, and then Vincent, the Vincent Crook says that if yeah. we have um, the amount between five hundred and six thousand dollars today, he would give us the money right. today. That's what they want. They want the interest up front. And yes, he has three million dollars set aside for us to do the project. That's in our letter of commitment or letter of intent from him. As was mentioned by Eric earlier, that he has been involved with a couple different projects on the Embarcadero. He chomps at the bit for them. He's eager to jump in on these projects. In fact, he told me specifically he was upset when he finally got paid off on a loan that was on a property on the Embarcadero because it was so lucrative to him. Um, he is there if need be. However, we are pursuing better options, more viable, less costly. However, the project still pencils out even at a higher interest rate with a hard money loan through Midcoast Capital, which in our letter of intent is right there, three million available, not to mention the five, six hundred thousand that we currently have. And that number isn't um, what's what's the word? Stagnant, I believe we could there is more available potentially on that if need be, from her father, from Giovanni, from my liquidation of my asset. So okay. we are ready to do this. Okay. We have worked hard. And we okay. can do this. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Matt, you, you were prepared for a motion? Is that what you're here? I think I am. Um, I'd like to, um, and please, um, you guys help me out with this. I'd like to make a motion that we consent the, a conditional COL. 
and the conditions are for a marketing plan, business plan, and a concrete Centennial Parkway funding um, amount. Can, can I can I help a little bit? So we're, yes. you're talking about add conditions yes. to, to it. So do you want to start with the conditions first? Is that what you're talking about? So the, I, you said consent, and I, I just want to make sure you're talking. I think so. So you're talking about uh, conditions, so you want to add the, um, the conditions first. Yes. Okay, talk through that, and I'll, I'll Okay, so the three conditions are um, a marketing plan, a business plan, and a concrete Centennial parking Parkway funding amount. Okay, so marketing and business plan. And a Centennial. And a Centennial. And a Centennial uh, um, Parkway contribution. Parkway contribution. So we have, I've got two conditions. I'm kind of putting one condition. I'm just writing notes based on what you're saying. So um, condition of marketing and business plan. So that being, right. um, any, any con were you, no, okay. Um, marketing and, and business plan. So we've already received one. So do we want um, actually, some more? Well, actually, um, for instance, John, um, in terms of the marketing pl uh, business plan, um, could you suggest some, when you may not be in agreement with this, but however, in terms of your expertise, um, what sort of wording could we put on that business plan that um, in terms of your commentary saying the current business plan being superficial and too uh, um, not sufficient? Would, how, what, any sort of words that you would add to that? Matt, with all due respect, I, I won't support the motion, so I, I can't. No problem. I, I, I do apologize. I really want to be helpful, but... Okay. Mr. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. Or Councilman Matkowski, um, I think what you're trying to achieve is getting a professionally prepared marketing plan and professionally prepared business plan. That, that's what you're looking for. And I'm assuming that what you're also suggesting is approve the COL with all the conditions that were already in the staff report and add to that these other three conditions. A professionally prepared marketing plan, a professionally prepared business plan, and some express dollar amount to be contributed toward the Centennial Parkway. Yes, within, and then can I put a time requirement on that? You, yes. Um, Marlis, we talked about 60 days. Um, do we have any other sort of um, dates, or are we satisfied with 60 days? That would change the COL language, which gives them until December 31st. So we want to also amend that to within 60 days. Correct? Okay. Yes. So, so, the, so the item number one. Right. Item number one would be changed to 60 days instead of. Along with the additional uh, requirements. With the understanding that the financial commitment you're going to get in 60 days is not a real defined financial commitment because you're not going to get that now. Well, it says letter of commitment for from accredited financers. I understand. And what I'm saying to you is right. the letter of commitment that you're going to get at this stage is going to be contingent laden. Right. And, okay. and the proof of uh, cash reserves. When you say cash reserves, you mean the dollars they actually have in hand? Proof of, yes, the dollars that they actually have in hand. Meaning the $166,000 that's been referenced? No, plus the additional monies that they have been guaranteed by from other individuals, a letter of commitment. That, that to me is the letter of commitment side. It's not the cash in hand because it's okay. not their cash. Okay. Well, unless somebody gives it to them. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, so if I may, we, rather than yeah, 60 yeah. days, can we just put November 1st as the date, which is approximately 60 days? Yep, that, that's fine with me. I'm, I'm, I'll just pencil it in November 1st. Is everybody's good with that? Okay, so November 1st, 2017. Matt, you want to get a, one little. I know Joe, Joe pretty much crafted what we yep, were talking totally about. Yep, you totally did. Um, so we we're talking about a marketing business, to a marketing business plan professionally prepared, uh, a, an express dollar amount uh, a commitment to the Centennial Parkway, 
um, obtain the financial letters or command or financial pre approved as an item number one instead of reading December 31st, it'd be November 1st. That's what I have so far written down. All right, so with that, um, what else do we need to put into this motion? It's your motion. It's your motion. Can I ask a clarifying question on this? Yep. The marketing plan, business plan, centennial figure, this is all going to be wrapped into the consent of landowner agreement as a condition of it. Yes. In addition to all the timeline stuff we've already got in there. Yeah. Just it's, now got fi it's now got 15 conditions. Yeah. And can I ask another clarifying question? <laughs> Who's going to be the judge of the marketing plan, business plan? Are we bringing that back to council in the future? So they perform, they provide all the stuff, they've got the commitment stuff they need from the bank. We bring that back to council for a reality check, make sure we're still good and council's still good with it. And if we're good, we just continue on with the COL. Yes. Okay. Just want to clarify. Okay. So... With that, do we have to do? Do I try to re say that, or does that stand as a motion? I think we have enough information to have there be a clear motion. Okay. As Could I as, have the motion read do. back, please? Yeah. Because I don't so understand. I, yeah. Matt, do you want to give a stab at it? Uh, okay, sure. Um, I make a motion that we, um, that this COL. Approve the COL? That we approve the COL with the conditions stated for a professionally um, prepared business plan, marketing plan, and with a concrete um, uh, um, Centennial Parkway commitment. Commitment to Centennial Parkway. And that this um, that these commitments, along with all the other um, milestones, be met conditions. by November 1st. Okay, we've got a motion. Not not all the other 12 milestones, just the, the one that had December 31st. Oh, just the first milestone. And if, I hate to muddy the water, but the con, the substantial contribution to Centennial Parkway, do you want to try and nail that down, or do you want to bring that back as to what that should be? Uh, well, there's no discussion about a second. Am I, are we waiting for a second? Or? I'll second the motion. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Motion by Mr. Makowetsky, second by Mr. McPherson. Discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Um, my my question is: How can you expect any applicant to um, make their own recommendation as to the amount that they're going to contribute to Centennial Parkway when we have no idea of a concept as of yet? I think that's an unfair, yeah. uh, onerous um, um, requirement. It makes doesn't make any sense to me. And and I think it seems like we're making stuff up to get this thing passed for the applicant. I, I don't get it. I'm sorry. So on, on that side of things, uh, so you, we do have a concept plan by the council, um, and uh, and we were going to go with this thing. You're going to get a little further down the road, but fast forward for the day. Um, I, I think it makes a lot of sense, and Miss Hanson sort of referenced this. And, and talking with her neighbors down there. Um, it makes a lot of sense to go sit down and talk with Fort Caldwell and the Libertine and Doug uh, Redigan and Rose's Land. It's all on. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's where they would need to go. They probably need to sit down and all talk, and that was sort of what we were going to do internally down, down the road. But I think that's probably how you're going to figure out what they can and are willing to do in that location, given the current concept. So I think that's probably the conversation that needs to happen uh, on that side of things versus just Throw a number out there. No, you, you're absolutely right, John. That's a, a great suggestion. So, could we, in terms of make a, maybe another condition on, to the um, motion that TLC meet with these other landowners within the 60 days and come back with a concrete number? Um. Maybe this one will work better. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think they should at least come back with maybe a concept about what they're, you know, combined willing to bring forward because they're all going to be bringing projects back in the same time frame. So having them all talk right now is a, is a great idea and they can sit down and 
I'll be available to them as well to sit down and go over what was approved in the concept plan, and then they can have the conversation about where they where they would like to go. I think to some extent you don't have. I mean, Bert Caldwell probably hasn't gone down the road other than he's seen the concept plan for Centennial Parkway, at least that side of on that side of the Embarcadero. But I don't know that he's given it a whole lot more thought about what they want to do. But at least they can start having those conversations now versus later. No, you're absolutely right. And John, that's a, um, I, I really I, I totally agree with you in terms of that. Um, I'm just going. Red expressed how important the Centennial Parkway is to that area, and so I was looking for more of a concrete number. But however, I would just I would be also in terms of attaching a, a condition uh, condition to this motion that. I mean, I, I don't know if that's still too vague, saying they, these bodies have to get together and meet. That could still just be, you know, mean nothing also. I don't know if there's any sort of way any, we get any meat from this. Point of clarification, if we could either vote on the motion and or withdraw the first and the second and then have a re-motion, that would be appropriate right now? I, I would I would agree, totally. and so right. basically we could um, and we do have a motion on the floor. Unless someone wants to amend it, uh, I would ask to call the question and uh, and for with further discussion. If there's no further discussion or a, any access uh, any intent to make an amendment to the motion, I'll just call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 So we have uh, three. Uh, all opposed. No. Opposed. Um, so we have uh, three two. Um, Councilmember Heading, Mayor Irons opposing, and so the motion carries uh, based on the motion. So if there's any other clarification on motions that want to be discussed, that's open for that. Uh, seeing none, I'll, I'm looking towards our staff. There looks like there might be a question. I, I understood that there was going to be some desire to further expand what that um, centennial, centennial? Condition was going to be, so if that if that's the intent of at least three people up there, then someone needs to make an additional motion to say what that is going to be, based on what um, Mr. Graham said. If you want to, I'm not saying you have yeah. to. I'm saying so. Right now, the the condition based on on uh, um, on the motion that was approved three two um, is that they would be they would come back with a uh, some sort of. Um, Expressed dollar amount contribution um, based on the conversation we had that it might be better to um, have the three entities down there coordinate how that goes based on staff input, which I would agree with. But right now we have a motion that has passed with that outlay. So uh, unless um, I, I am, um, I guess I, I'll make I'll make a, a motion to help with this. <laughs> To go, I guess so. The motion would be that um, uh, we strike the condition on the previous motion uh, that involved the Centennial Parkway um, specific amount, um, and we um, get a part of the condition of this is a commitment uh, to the Centennial Parkway um, with the other um, applicants being. Um, Doug Redican and Burke Caldwell in the development of that portion of the um, um, Centennial Parkway within the two lease sites. Um, is, is that what you were alluding to, Scott? And, and, and it's I, and I don't I don't I, I don't think there should be an expectation that um, the entire Centennial Parkway is going to be developed through through this it's not mine by any means but go ahead the intent was to really have them um, look at that portion that's on the, the west side which is uh, basically the parking lot opening yeah the, be, between the between uh, Rose's Landing and Libertine uh, yeah so to have them get together figure out what they might be able to do as it relates to what was approved there and then come back with something it, it, it could I mean I guess they could figure out dollar amounts they're willing to yeah. put forward and that could come forward. It just 60 days seems like a pretty short amount of time no, for them to I, kick that around. No, no, look I, at specifics. It seems, it seems unlikely that they would be able to do that. Um, so it might be better to get them to sort of agree on what their commitment might be moving forward as to the improvements they're willing to make there. And we can have that conversation with council. And, and, and in the COL, there is, there is language that there's a commitment to the um, development of Centennial Parkway. 
Could it be as simple as a condition to participate in whatever funding the city cr creates, funding mechanism the city creates for this parkway, whether it be an assessment district, an impact fee, or other mechanism? That would be perfect. P point of order, I'm just trying to get clarification because I do want to be helpful and also be yep. a part of the vote. So um, uh, there's no second, and we're into discussion. So if, if I could ask for clarification on the motion, and then either a vote uh, on the motion, and then discussion, or just discussion so, and then a vote. Okay, so a motion to rescind um, the condition on the previous motion on Centennial Parkway, and I'll just leave it at that. And then the other motion would be to um, uh, have the applicant have a condition that they are committed to um, some sort of fee or condition to um, mechanism to support the Centennial Parkway as deemed by staff. Yeah, and I'll, I'll second that. Okay, so that's the second. motion. Mm -hmm. there's, two, there's two motions. Right. You'll second yes. Both? yes. Got it. So, so that's the motion, and we have a second. Thanks for that. Um, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries. So we have a, we have a unanimous con for the Centennial Parkway portion, and we have a 3 2 um, on the COL. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, anything else on this? I just want to, if, if that's not, if there's anything else, I was going to conclude this there, item there and is. take a short break. We, we need to deal with the um, use of the site after the March date. Right, council direction on lease site expires. Do you want to take a short break and come back to that? Can we just take a short break okay. and then we'll come back and we'll deal with that? Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Welcome back. Um, so we're still on item C2, and we wanted to continue the discussion on um, uh, temporary. Um, yeah. How to Eric? Direction on how to operate the lease site after Thank you. March 31st, 2018. Thanks. The three options I presented earlier. So um, you want to carry that discussion just a little bit further. And so we l you're looking for some direction on how we want to do that. Sorry yeah, about that. Yeah, some direction on how we want to deal with the lease site after lease's expiration. Um, I recommend it if CLL is granted, do a temporary lease with TLC Enterprises. The other two options are go with the existing leaseholder on holdover um, with the existing lease, or the city just take over the lease site <coughs> and operate it as a building lease as opposed to a ground lease. Um, should we go into holdover, the existing leases, terms and conditions stay in place? Um, should we go with a short-term lease, interim lease with TLC? Um, and obviously, with the new CLL parameters, if they're able to meet everything to the council's satisfaction, come March, I'm assuming that's going to be known whether we're still going with TLC or not. Um, if we are, and they've met all the parameters and we're continuing to move forward, we would bring back some draft terms and conditions for council approval. I'm not looking for the exact terms and conditions we'd be looking to put in that interim lease. And then if the city takes it over, then the city just takes it over again as a building lease and we manage the one existing operating business under the C gallery as a sublease. 
Okay. And so the condition to do uh, issue a temporary lease basically is do we want to do that March 2018? All those terms and conditions will come back is what, is yes. what I got from Yeah, that. if we did it in okay. temporary and interim lease with TLC, <clears throat> provided we're still moving forward with TLC, we would come back and, and probably close okay. session and start negotiating those terms. So um, any, uh, any questions or discussion? And I'm looking to my right first, and then move it back this Question, way. Okay. Yep, go ahead. I'm sorry, right first. Oh. Um, have we talked to the potential um, um, applicants about Eric? Have we talked to the potential applicants about assuming the lease now or earlier? And do we know where they stand with that? I have had some discussions. They can only assume it after. We can only do anything after March 31st next year, obviously. Um, they, if it's allowable, they can answer that themselves. They would, from what I, um, the conversations I've had with them, they would continue to operate, obviously, under the C Gallery and look at the restaurant and, and once they get inside and see what's, what's there and what's left to be operated, um, they would propose to move forward and, and get the lease site back at least up to a a little more reasonably kept shape and get that business back open up front, um, whether it be restaurant or retail, um, yet to be determined, but they would intend to operate the whole building, not leave it halfway shuttered. Thank you. Marlis? I don't have additional questions. Okay, anybody this way? Okay, so um, I, I don't have any comments on that. I guess their option is just go ahead and approving um, a temporary lease as of March 2018 as recommended, and we'd come back with terms. Um, I guess the other option could be um, coming back November 1st. It, depending on how that goes, we can do it then. But uh, those are that's how I say it, and so I'm looking for a motion either way. Yeah, it's a good point. Once we come back with mm -hmm. by November 1st, we could definitely have some more direction. So, so uh, uh, go ahead. The the first part. I'm sorry. The first. So, the, so basically, what our options are, if we want to move forward with a, a temporary lease um, mm -hmm. starting March 31st, 2018. Mm -hmm. So, do we want to proceed with that? We could make that motion. If we yeah. wanted to do, um, maybe consider that come November 1st, we could do it then. Um, uh, and so those what I those are I see as option viable options and looking for a motion either way. I would move that we. Um, have staff uh, commence the process of obtaining a temporary lease to be effective 331 of 2018. It'd be 41. 41, 2018. The lease goes through 331. With the applicants and bring it back for closed session approval or discussion, I should say. Okay, so we have a, a motion and do we have a second? We have a second. So a motion a second. So discussion, just question. So we'd be bringing back the conditions of that in closed session. So just want to just, that was what the, the discussion was and per closed session rules were okay with that. Correct. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Motion carries. Uh, five zero. Dana, sorry. Um, and so that kind of that that will conclude item C two. Okay, we're good. Okay, all right. Item C three. Item C three is a review of the resolutions to be considered at the annual League of California Cities conference um, coming up this September. And um, Dana, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. On July 11th, the council selected Mayor Irons as the voting delegate and Mayor Pro Tem Heading as the alternate voting delegate for the annual business meeting to be held at the League of California Cities Annual Conference. This item is an opportunity to review the resolutions to be considered during the business meeting and provide direction to the city's voting delegates. Since the proposed resolutions were safety, public safety focused, we asked Chief Allen and Chief Knuckles to uh, review them and provide their input and those memos have been included with the staff report. Um, they both support the resolutions as presented. So staff recommends the council authorize the voting delegates to vote in favor of resolutions one and two. Great, Dana, thanks for that. And uh, thanks, Chief and Chief, on those memos. Appreciate that that input, I, the, the double chief um, thing. So sorry. Um, uh, any, any other, any questions at this point from council? I, I just had a, a question about if the sheriff's office has taken a position on these or, and
So, wow. <laughs> mine is working. <laughs> So uh, the uh, our local law enforcement, uh, California law enforcement, support resolution one. Okay. Any further? Any other questions? Just a comment that I've read both, and I'm highly supportive of uh, both of the um, for safety issues um, for both uh, resolutions, and would move their approval. Yes. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Heading, a second by Councilmember Davis. Any further discussion? Uh, just one real com. Um, uh, that's good. Um, seeing no other discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. None. Motion carries. Um, okay, with that, that concludes our business items, and we move on to. Were there any further comments on that item? Seeing none, we'll move on to Council Direction Future Agenda items. Any, anything from council? Uh, the only thing I, and man, maybe this isn't a future agenda item, I don't know, so I'll just ask it. I would like to know where we stand on the uh, Market Plaza. Uh, it was the RFP and then we, we had a broker and I just don't know where we stand on it. I don't know if I can ask it in a, or it has to be an agenda item or what. <laughs> yeah. This is fun. It was fixed until I touched it. Uh, um, so, yeah, so um, Cal we were working on a contract with California Hotel Brokers. Um, during that process, uh, Aaron Graves uh, decided they didn't, they didn't have capacity to take us on as a client um, for this um, for the Market Plaza project, and so now I'm out looking for some other folks, the direct broker, uh, go through the brokerage to do that. So um, got a couple irons in the fire. In fact, got uh, just got an email this evening from Aaron uh, about a couple of other folks that might be uh, able to take us on. So betting it right now and going to be ringing back something to council as soon as I have an answer. Yeah. Thanks. And if we don't have any future agenda items, um, our next uh, regular city council meeting is Tuesday, September 12th, 6 p.m., right here at the Vets Hall. And we can adjourn the meeting. Thanks.